Killzone is a series which occupies a pretty special place for me. While mileage certainly varies release to release, the general consensus always seemed to be that these are little more than above average games. A competent enough entry into the era of first person military shooter over saturation, but falling short of both the wide audience appeal of a Battlefield or Call of Duty, and of living up to its kinda baffling Halo Killer marketing moniker. But despite that, this series, starting with my introduction in Killzone 2, is one which has kept my interest and captured my imagination more than almost any other from the PS3 lineup. Now, this video is going to be long, and we have more to talk about by the end than a simple binary, is it good? So, to get out of the way the question of whether, on replay, the series holds up, yes. Yes, it does. But, aside from the impressive graphical technology, with them often doubling as tech demos for whatever Sony's latest hardware was, the usually explosive moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, and some absolute top-tier soundtracks. The singular standout element for me, which elevate them above the generic sci-fi shooter they've always risked devolving into, is the world itself. How Guerrilla's stellar visual design, the game's themes, lore, and presentation intersect to create, for the most part, one of the most grounded and compelling fictional conflicts in a video game ever. The second extrasolar war, the 24th century conflict between neighbouring worlds and the Alpha Centauri system Vecta and Helgan, brings all the brutality, baggage, propagandising and contradiction of any conflict in the real world, simultaneously presenting a blatant good versus evil story complete with space Nazis and the guilt-free dehumanisation as provides the player as they gun them down, all the while weaving a far more complex tale of historical injustices and grievances, both real and imagined, and serious and unanswerable questions about what is actually right if indeed there is a correct answer here. But anyway, that's enough groundwork, we got plenty to cover. But first, this is an unsolicited shilling of the Red Scott Gaming Patreon. I hope to do more of this content regularly in the future, and a healthy patron support helps ensure I can. Plus, at all tiers, we try to do regular live streams of different games and just chill with you guys. It's not really off the ground yet, I admit, but it's something I want to focus on more as it grows. But that's enough of that. Back to the 50,000 word script. Holy shit, this was meant to just be a small video to fill the gap before I do the big one. What the fuck is wrong with me? I'm organising things a little differently this time. To avoid myself spinning off into a tangent every three minutes, I've split this into distinct parts, separating the start to finish run throughs of each game from chunks of more focused discussions on a specific aspect. So, please join me as we look through the development, gameplay, story, lore, and on this occasion, analysis of the real world influences and applicability of Killzone. While Killzone wouldn't appear until 2004, the seeds were planted as early as 1999, with a trio of small Dutch development studios, Orange Games, Digital Infinity, and Formula with the latter of the three already as of the previous year under the umbrella of Lost Boys Digital Media Company, both Orange and Digital Infinity were likewise in the process of merging into what would soon be branded Lost Boys Games. But it was March of 99 when the first meeting between the Dutch companies and Sony Computer Entertainment took place in London. During this meeting, several pitches were made and demonstrations given, including a first-person shooter RPG named Core and Beyond Gaming, a 3D model for a shell oil rig running on the same engine. Sony was impressed in part by the game core, but even more so by Orange Games' graphic engine. The meeting ended with Sony asking the representatives a simple question. Would this engine run on their upcoming console? Over the coming months, discussions continued with Lost Boys hitting on the idea of a Space Marines, not that one, sci-fi shooter for Sony's PlayStation 2, with suggestions being floated for a colonial marine shooter based directly off the Aliens franchise, at least until negotiations with Fox broke down, and honestly, just as well. I'm still getting moaned at to this day for not covering every one of the 30-odd Alien and AVP games on that retrospective, we didn't need another one. By December 99, Lost Boys pitched their game in the form of a 3-minute video running on the core engine, featuring sci-fi marines fighting unspecified off-screen enemies. 
While far from a game and barely even a premise, they nevertheless landed a contract with Sony to produce a first-person squad-based shooter, co-named simply Marines. With the project finally settled on, it wasn't long into pre-production before the Aliens-inspired Marines vs Creatures concept was dropped in favour of pitting humans against humans in a space colonial conflict. Still naturally drawing from classic sci-fi sources, Blade Runner was cited as inspiration for a story of cloning gone wrong with humanity exiling vat-grown humans to a distant planet who returned generations later for vengeance, deformed and mutated by their life far from the sun. The studio latched onto it with particular interest in the idea of kinship between the two sides, providing an opportunity to create more nuanced conflict than man versus evil aliens. In fact, this theme was so intrinsic to the project that it led to the initial title for the final game. Kin. Somewhere along the lines the specifics of Kin's plot took shape, and a realisation that the necessity for clones had evaporated, being an unneeded extra level of contrivance, instead becoming two human factions on a pair of distant colonies. And with the intervention of Sony Marketing in 2002 suggesting a title more evocative of the core shooty pew pew gameplay, we finally approach something recognisably Killzone. But there was a way to go yet. Discussing the visual design aspect and how it shaped the original feel and tone of the game and series going forward could take a whole book. In fact, there is a book, right here, and it's really fucking interesting. But there are two major takeaways, and both fairly unique to the place and time of these Dutch developers. The Netherlands were never exactly a hub for the gaming industry. In fact, after merging, Lost Boys Games had become the largest game development studio in the country. But lacking a vibrant local industry, it was difficult to find talent with experience specifically in gaming and lacking artists with a gaming background, they recruited industrial and architectural designers for their game. Where more established studios would use concept art, often prioritising outside aesthetics over functionality, especially if we are talking weapons, vehicles or machinery, the visual designers at Lost Boys designed… well, weapons, vehicles and machinery, much in the way they'd be designed by actual manufacturers. Buildings, and therefore the level interiors in-game, were drawn up from the inside out following architectural designs. Tanks were designed from their engines to propulsion systems and crew compartments outwards, and the effect of this idiosyncratic way of designing a game world resulted in an extreme focus on functionality, utility, and ultimately, realism. And not to jump too far ahead, this affinity for machinery has been present through all of their future games, up to and including the robotic creatures of Horizon Zero Dawn. But the second factor which shaped Killzone's identity came from the decision to base it around a World War II in space. Now, the Second World War is hardly an untapped reservoir, and the Nazis have been a cornerstone of video game cannon fodder basically since violence in video games was a thing. But it's worth remembering that while Wolfenstein's id Software and many other of the world's leading game devs at the time were American companies embracing a Hollywood view of the war, the Netherlands had been under actual Nazi occupation for over half a decade of their history. Members of the dev team had parents or grandparents who lived under the jackpot of Nazism who saw their country both conquered and liberated, with admittedly a false start on the latter, and the war had an undoubted influence on the cultural zeitgeist. Yet, by the 90s and the turn of the millennium, the national narrative on the war had gone through a period of reflection. The story of good and evil, which makes for a Hollywood movie or a BG Blazkowicz adventure, began to peel back and reveal uncomfortable nuance. Having settled on a story of mankind fighting itself, the devs looked at this tragic period of our own history where mankind did just that choosing to revisit it in a sci-fi setting, but with all the discomfort and complexity it brings. Past concepts, such as the mutated clone exiles returning for vengeance, became fascistic stand-ins clad in black SS uniforms, sealed in Soviet-style gas masks from life in their harsh, toxic world, and, most iconic of all, red glowing eyes peering out of First World War-inspired goggles, which were only made red and glowy after playtesters complained about not being able to spot the fuckers out from the grey environments. The ostensive heroes, meanwhile, representative of liberal democracies, maintained a very Aliens Colonial Marines aesthetic, whether from the game's original influences, or from a shared pooling from sources with the US military during World War II or Vietnam. The stage was set for the conflict, a war between the prosperous Earth colony known as Vecta and their neighbour as a seeded former colony under the thumb of a totalitarian regime. Lost Boys, rebranded Guerrilla Games in 2003, knew even now that these antagonists would be the stars of the show. All they needed was a name. After playing around with words from Dutch, German and Old English, they settled on a name meaning Guys from Hell. Hellgast. And in 2004, with this masked enemy and Nazi-inspired iconography adorning marketing and box art, Killzone finally released on the PlayStation 2. K. 
kill zone doesn't begin with a text crawl. It doesn't start by attempting to explain the world or provide historical context. No, it starts with a call to war. My people, sons and daughters of Helgan, for many years we have been a broken nation, shunned, oppressed, and conquered by those we sought to escape. Ten years ago, I asked for time, and that time was granted by you. You, the strength in my arm, the holders of my dreams. Aside from a reference to some past exodus for freedom and a glimpse at the hardships endured by those original Helgan colonists, there's no attempt to delve into the centuries of backstory at this time. I have to assume that this withholding of information was deliberate, and as easy as it would be for me to go through the entire timeline of preceding events, I'll refrain for now from discussing anything not apparent in-game or in the November 19th edition of Vecta Today, which doubles as this game's instruction manual. For real, this is one of the most creative instruction books I've ever seen. I miss this in games. Like, what the fuck is this shit? Boring. Low effort. Boo. In the time you have given me, I have rebuilt our nation. I have rebuilt our strength. And I have rebuilt our pride. Our enemies at home have been re-educated. We have given them new insights into our cause. On this day, we stand united once more. On this day, those driven to divide us will hear our voice. On this day, we shall act as one, and we shall be ignored no more. General Adams, sir. We got multiple hell gas vessels approaching. What do we do, sir? Fire! I'll be trying not to interrupt these opening cutscenes too much because goddamn Brian Cox kills it in this role every time, that role being the Helgan leader Skolar Vizari. Right now he's a bit of an unknown, besides dripping with 20th century totalitarian aesthetic, from his rhetoric to Mussolini inspired appearance, and even his name a reference to Joseph Stalin, and that while vilified by Earth, is seen as a liberator and hero by the Helgan people, besides all the murders. Oh no, not health and safety guy. You know you're getting written up for this, Sonny Jim. Defenders of the Hellgas dream. Now is our time! Despite the opening serving exclusively as an introduction to the Hellgas, we suddenly, and unsurprisingly, start the game in the trenches of the other side, as Captain Jan Templar of the Vecton ISA. Should note, while I do own the PS2 version, I'm playing the HD remaster for this, just since… I mean it was there. I'll take actual visibility over authenticity, but it plays exactly the same, and honestly it's still a fairly good looking game, even on the PS2. We'd engaged in a fighting retreat, moving with a squad of ISA while gunning down waves of Hellgas troopers rushing us from the smoky no man's land. As a first level it's a good sequence with a mix of friendly and enemy NPCs and the tension of seeing silhouettes moving in the haze not knowing whether to fire or not, until you see a glint of red eyes or a sniper round hitting the side of your bunker. Saying that, the Hellgas tactics we see on display here, such as run at machine gun emplacement, suggests either a commander who's fine with throwing men at the enemy in a ruthless strategy of attrition, or equally plausibly, kinda shit AI? I can take either explanation. At the same time, this is functioning as a tutorial, so lone troopers standing with their back to you or in an otherwise empty room is acceptable when they're obviously there to teach you how to melee strike or cook grenades, the latter of which is one of the most satisfying and useful skills in the game by the way, hell, the series. You'll need to cross the industries Dark. to get to HQ, Hellgast no. have broken through. In general, there's actually a decent amount of weapon variety right from the get go. 
Barely out the tutorial yet, we start with our standard M82 with grenade launcher, can swap over to the Hellgas boxy mass produced STA 52 with its underslung shotgun, for which you'll find plenty of ammo and fallen enemies, making it really not a bad shout. The sniper, of course, and as we take on an enemy APC, we're given a rocket launcher with enough ammo to be kept on past this one mandatory use of it. At least the game's not stingy, I always feel robbed when military shooters hold out their coolest weapons on the player, only letting them use them during highly scripted specific moments. I appreciate that. In a welcome reprieve from brown environment to grey, we fight close quarters through this industrial area. Hostiles! We are reinforcements! You'll notice that the Hellgas all have these Cockney accents for some reason, while the Vectons are by and large all American. I have no lore explanation for this. I think it's just a continuation of the tradition to make villains inexplicably British in sci-fi things. <laughs> AI continues to not really impress, and we end up taking on some tanks with the rocket launcher, which I've been saving exactly for this type of situation. Fun fact, space colonialism aside, this game's been very low tech so far, with conventional firearms, brick and mortar buildings, but for some reason the Hellgast vehicles all hover with these repulsor propulsion systems like it's Star Wars. It seems kind of strange, until you realise this was just a compromise due to engine limitations. They couldn't get tank tracks to work properly. We finally see some green as we reach the bombed out ISA command centre, seeking out General Vaughton who's in charge of the city's defence. After fending off another wave, we see some armour of our own, but the base itself is being overrun as we fight through to the General. Uh, it's good to see you, Yan. You too, General. What's happening out there? Are we holding? Well, it's impossible to tell with the comms as they are, but we're being attacked by the 3rd Helgen Army, led by a General Lente. If Hellgas ships keep on flooding in with more troops, we may as well pack up right here, right now. We get a little more context here for something we saw in the opening. These space defence platforms, commanded by a General Adams, built specifically to defend against an anticipated Hellgas invasion, failed. Earth's United Colonial Navy has promised to send its own fleet, which should easily turn the tide, Earth's military and manpower realistically outmatching any colony, even Helgan, and all we have to do is hold out, with Vaughton planning to take a shuttle to the SD platform to perform a two-key override only he and Adams have clearance for. Meantime, we're told to find an allied spy named Colonel Haka, but with the base about to fall, Yan's first sent to recover Vaughton's platform security key from the other side of the base, leading to lots of hallway office shootouts. Oh, and remember what I said about cooking grenades? See, the ideal is not let it bounce or even touch the ground. Just want to throw pure explosive energy straight at them. Thunder Punch! Don't try this at home. In the courtyard, we use this conveniently placed MG to take out some jet bikes and far too many waves of troopers who are still just running headlong into the grinder and into the base's research wing. We encounter a new enemy type with these light troopers, though putting aesthetics aside, the behaviour of all trooper types to my eye have been the same so far. It might have been cool if these guys charged at you with SMGs or something, flushing you from cover while regular infantry hung back to pick you off. Even design wise they're a little boring, but at least they still got the mask and goggle combo to keep them consistent. Unfortunately the same can't be said for the heavily armed elite troopers we encounter later. Big baldy cunts who forgo the signature mask for some Mr Freeze looking thing. I'm not a fan, and no doubt these are going to be in the running for my least favourite trooper design of the series. Oh, now that is a satisfying glass shatter effect. Mm, yeah, that, that's a solid 9 out of 10. I'll admit, this area does start to drag a little, especially by the second identical cylindrical silo room, but we eventually do come to where the security key is. Well, well. Your ass in my hands again, Templar. If you know what I mean. So here we meet party member number two. Shadow Marshal and Templar's... ex, I guess? Luger. Sent by Vaughton to help us locate Colonel Haka, but meantime the SD platform still needs his key, so it's off back to the General. And speaking of the platform, we learn that General Adams is a fucking creep. Surely a master technician of your calibre can find a way to bring the weapons back online. No. No? Well, do you believe in God? Hmm? Well, whatever it is you pray to, I'd start praying now that Vaughton reappears. Anyway, with Luger in tow, we never have the option to swap between characters for missions going forward. 
It's a nice feature that never actually comes back again in future games. Aside from starting with different weapons and abilities, with Luger using the silenced M66 SMG, knife and infrared goggles, the game itself does change depending on who you've selected. Having just unlocked her, I use her for the next level. Enemies are sprinkled around with backs turned to allow for easy stealth kills, and later emerging out onto a station platform with allied troops pinned down by Hellgast on the opposite side, we're tasked with sneaking across and planting charges on their barricaded door. Replaying the same level as Templar though, and yep, stealth sections are just shooting button tunnel now. Meanwhile, the station does have us reverse roles, with us now providing covering fire for NPC Luger as she sneaks across to the door. To be honest, playing this years ago, I never knew about these alternate paths, spending most of the game either as Luger or our next companion without changing it up much. But playing it now, I can tell where these path divergences usually are. Though saying that, I don't go back to play as Templar Mick Boreface once in this entire playthrough and fuck knows what his gimmick even is. Moving from the train station to an open park area, I have to admit that while no doubt far from their fully realised vision for this future prosperous city due to obvious technical limits, there is some sense of planning and recognisability as a place where people actually live rather than just randomly placed buildings. In fact, remove the hell gas and fix the ugly grey haze and it almost seems like a nice place. Sometimes. The visual design book talks about these limitations, explaining that the overuse of slums and industrial areas, as well as the washed out grey brown colour scheme throughout, was yet another compromise for not having the tech to represent the true Vector city as imagined. But honestly, especially when I come to this park area, I think they did a good job with what they could. While in the park, we take out some AA guns and hit another cutscene, where we're introduced to, quite possibly, the most insufferable character of the series. Helping mop up what's left of the Hellgas convoy, we're told by the new guy that the general was captured and is being held nearby. He's being held captive in the gatehouse on this tier. Well, let's get going then! General, are you alright? Yeah, I'm fine. Jan, did you get the security key? Right here, sir. We had trouble getting here. If it hadn't been for this guy... Sergeant Rico Velasquez, sir. Well, Sergeant... It seems these two owe you It's uh... the enemy who owe me, not these two. The Hellgas scum wiped out my entire platoon, and they'll be paying off that debt in blood for as long as I breathe. Yeah, so that's pretty much Rico. And no surprise, but he's our third party member. The entire next map is just a spiralling flight of stairs, and intended entirely as an excuse to let the player rip and tear into mobs of conveniently placed Hellgast. Not sure again what commander deemed it necessary to garrison this random, tactically insignificant stairwell. I'm sure these troops could have been needed elsewhere, but who am I to once again question the Hellgas tactics? Keep on charging those MGs, you'll win eventually. While playing, I had to assume this level was meant purely as an introduction to Rico's playstyle, and couldn't possibly be like this for, say, Luger. And right enough, playing as her, it becomes... Climb down elevator shaft. Yeah, not as fun. You're going to hear me mention this a lot, but god damn I love the vehicle designs in these games. Not the best view here admittedly, especially with the insane bloom going on, but the Overlord dropship has to be one of my favourite. Love a good dropship I do. The fighting takes us through a mall, which once again grounds us in something recognisable. It's always going to be more poignant I guess when we're fighting somewhere that we can actually imagine existing normally and peacefully in the real world, rather than the generic industrial blair we'll end up getting a lot of. This, at least, would be a lesson they learn in future games. After some more industrial bleh and more of these dorks, we find the warehouse where Hacker is apparently being kept. Waltz in, find nothing, circle around a few times trying to trigger the cutscene, leave again, there we go. Oh god. What is it? Motherfucking filthy little piece of shit! He's a hellgast. Was a hellgast. Hold it! Fuck you. Rico! Well, it's him all right. We've got the right guy. You Hellgast? Half Hellgast, half human. <laughs> I don't want to fucking imagine how that works. Rico, please, stop with the racism. We'll see what side he's on when I've got this baby shoved up his papa's. So, with Haka the Hellgun completing our merry little band, we're supposed to bring him and his report to Vauten, who's already en route to the platform. So, it's off to a place called The Fortress to catch a shuttle. 
The fortress, huh? We're gonna need a boat. We'd better head for the docks. <laughs> Great seasickness. It's bad enough having to look at this mutant's face all day. For crying out loud, the racism, Rico. Tone it a smidge down. You bald fuck. Having finally left the city, we head through this coastal area, fighting tanks, snipers, and laying an ambush for an enemy convoy before reaching this beachfront villa or hotel. There's a pretty fun set piece here holding the location against a beach landing, and once again, these vehicle designs. Like, the landing crafts appear, what, twice in this game? They don't need to look this awesome. We've kept this area secure, but we have reports of Hellgast in other parts of the docks. You bald fuck! I was really enjoying the change of scenery with the beach areas, but as soon as we hit the docks, we're back to concrete and crates. But worse, they go on forever. Every turn of the corner lifts my hopes that we're finally at the end until, yep, yet another industrial bleh. This happens five or six times, and this was probably the only point in the game that I can think when I ever got bored. If we play as Hacker, we can be introduced to these race-sensitive trip mines? Question mark? Which only allow Hellgas to pass through them. Now, don't ask me how that works, and in fact the idea of a significant genetic difference between Hellgans and Vectans is brought into question later, but for now, video game. And this means some divergent paths when playing as Hacker as we scout ahead and try to open a route for the others. Wait! You're not gonna trust this freak to- Rico! Haka tells Templar he needs to access a computer to process whatever data it was he stole from the Hellgast before it could be brought to Vauten. Rico, being Rico, has a problem with this, and the lower half of his face lets us all know. How do we know he's not a double agent, huh? What's to say he's not on the other side? And how many of the other side do you calculate I've killed in the past hour? <laughs> you bastards don't even give a shit about your own. Try it, scum. Come on, try it. Back off, bitch. Stop! That's it! Enough! Because it's a long way to the fortress, and our chances, even if we pull together, are somewhere between slim and nil. So for the last time, get your shit together and start acting like soldiers! Okay, I take it back. Templar's gimmick is being the only one who isn't a fucking child. Cool. Haka explains that he discovered there was a computer aboard the SD platform that allowed the Hellgast to sabotage the system, but he needs time to identify which to inform General Adams of the breach. While this is going on, Vauten has already arrived with his key, ready to re-engage the defences. The computer under Hellgast control. It's General Adams' personal computer. What's the meaning of <laughs> The meaning? The meaning is... You lose. Traitor. Yeah, whatever. Kill him. With Adams outed as the most obvious traitor in military history, the Hellgast leading this invasion, General Joseph Lente, takes control of the space defences, giving them not only the means to annihilate Earth's fleet when it arrives, but the ability to orbitally strike anywhere on the surface. After, if you can believe it, yet more docks, we steal a couple of attack boats to try and make for the fortress. Ex-lovers in one and best buds in the other, until a missile attack sends us all crashing into the next level. For the next while, we're trudging through swamps, till eventually stumbling on a heavily fortified enemy firebase. The team is split on sneaking around or punching through, three guests on who suggested the latter, but for once, Legolas and Gimli agree on something, with Haka suggesting an attack here would actually make the rest of their journey through occupied territory simpler. So, the mighty brain agrees with the grunt. <laughs> That's a first. Even a monkey will write Shakespeare, given enough time. So you two agree on something. Get over it. We attack the firebase. Let's move out. What the fuck is a Shakespeare? Back to Brown for this level, we get some more trench warfare, cleaning out bunkers and destroying ammo dumps and rocket artillery, before taking on a dropship with an 80 gun and transitioning rather abruptly from Mangrove Swamp to Arid Wasteland as we come to the ISA Fortress, currently under siege. Our time here ends up being pretty short-lived, as it turns out there's no shuttles, so back to the swamps. Yay! But while we continue to mill about on the ground, between our rescue of Haka and our raids on the dock and firebase, Adams and Lente have started to take notice of us. I doubt an army of four will make it all the way up here, even if one of them is a Hellgast. As I say, let them know I'm coming down. After Haka hears a transmission saying that Adams is heading to the surface nearby, Templar decides we're changing quests and going after the traitor. After a heap of help on a Hellgast, we come to an open area. 
zone, if you will, covered by MGs and laser targeted artillery funneling us in with the intention to kill us in said zone. You might even call it some kind of suicide squad, sorry. But having not died, we kill this nutter in the laser targeting equipment before realising Adams was never here and this was all a setup. Rico being Rico immediately blames Haka. I mean, no harm, no foul. Wonder how Adams has taken it. Failed! There's only four of the little bastards. Yeah, sounds about right. Unimpressed, Lenti takes charge of the situation, opting to deal with them himself. Back on the surface, we're able to use this nutter's face mounted laser targeter to destroy enemy armour. We come across a couple new enemy types here too. Firstly, these heavy armour assault soldiers, who I completely forgot existed. Even though I have played this game before, I was kinda taken by surprise when I saw these Destiny helmeted fuckers come running at me over the hill, looking maybe a little bit out of place for most of the Hellgast in this game, but at least they do look kinda cool while doing it. We can also end up seeing a couple of these guys who, I swear after the first one I thought I'd killed Lente and somehow bugged out the cutscene from playing. I mean, sure, a little racist, not all Hellgans look the same, but that is legit just Hacker's face being reused there, right? Don't tell me it's not. We head through some jungle with different paths and opportunities to ambush enemy patrols, and while brief, it's one of the more visually appealing portions of the game. If not for the Fallout 3 green tint over everything, I'd almost say it's beautiful. Like, look, actual blue sky! Mostly. Unfortunately, after we take and collapse a bridge, the green returns to default brown in a fairly strong case of deja vu. Didn't we destroy this base already? We're even back to bombing ammo dumps again. Not honestly sure why they came this way, but at this point the four of us are basically unstoppable gods of war, so I guess it's just for shits and giggles. Bloodlust sated, our squad reassesses, deciding to hit a Helgan occupied missile base in hope of finding a transport to the platform before it's too late, while also seeing that Lente, anticipating us, is heading to the same place. You're about to tell me that they've been caught that Lente and his armies have no need to find them because they're already dead, that my actions instigated their downfall, and that Scholar Vasari is very pleased with me. No. Are you insane? Stop attacking no. immediately. We find the missile base overrun, its warheads being turned against ISA forces still fighting Invecta City. There's also a lot more of our favourite character here, practically becoming the standard enemy by this point. Which besides looking ugh, just really means a lot more ammo has to be spent per kill. Not like we're running out though. You the, the squad splits up to shut down the base's launch systems, hearing Lenti over the intercom as we carve our way through, ordering units to stop us, including these intimidating bodyguards, the last and highest health enemy unit in the game. Or at least, they're intimidating when they keep their visors down, otherwise, I don't know, they kinda look like some golf dad. We find Lente on a landing pad trying to escape, and we best the good general in a manner most fitting a man of his station. <laughs> With the platform cleared, we hear his final words, to Haka specifically, who as it's revealed was his chief of staff before defecting to the ISA. He could have been a general himself a long time ago, oh, but he changed. Developed a bleeding heart. Became a revolutionary. Yes, it's you who've changed, Lenti. You who sold your soul to the Sari for a taste of power. My family will attend a hero's funeral for me, Hacker. Your mother pretends you're dead already. The rest of your family never even mention your name. One of your brothers speaks of your heroism. <clears throat> At least he did, until I had him shot. <laughs> it's 30 minutes by air to the uplink. Let's go. With Adams aware and not particularly upset over Lente's death, he prepares his defences, while the squad lands their dropship a safe distance from the now alert station uplink, we were given a very brief moment with our game's romantic pairing, no the other one. Jan, when this is over... It's not going to be over. Not for a long time. If ever. On the bright side, we finally get this chance to have a good old look at the dropship, and... Oh, just... Mwah. Come to think of it, I am pretty sure this is the only vehicle to appear in every game, and... Yeah, good. Hold on, hold on, hold Western on, hold on. Thunder Punch! All clear here. Yeah, no all clear indeed. 
After fighting up the mountain, we reach the platform uplink where there's so many bald blokes and this missile launcher is doing hell on my peripheral vision. But we eventually reach the shuttle, prepping it for launch while holding off enemy reinforcements, and finally take off for the platform. Finally aboard the station, we have to disable the defences before Earth's fleet arrives. But, if nothing else, we finally have an environment that isn't concrete. Thank fuck. Still got this horrible green tint over everything, but whatever. Unfortunately, it seems we're too late, as we see the UCN ships warp in. Through the planet itself. Odd. I mean, sure, subspace, but to be honest, I don't really know what the mechanics of space travel are in this universe. They demonstrably have warp travel of some sort, but it's slow, going by the presumed days or weeks the fleet took to get here, and in Killzone 2 they cite it as two weeks from just Vector to Helgan within the same system. Though that could have been non-warp sublight speed, I don't know, ships can fly through the skybox, who am I to argue? With the fleet taking losses and firing back on the platform itself, the squad splits up, each member with their own objective for this last mission. Templar, the weapon system, Luger, the communications, Haka needs to stop these Hellgas parasite modules from self-destructing. And the fat boy? Poor Rico. No bully. Wait, actually, yes, bully always, he deserves it. Fuck! Well, I happen to be playing as said fat boy, and yeah, this entire section was just a 3 minute 48 second corridor shooter. Rico is definitely the turn your brain off option out of the four. Wait, hold on, what was that? Stand firm, comrades! Make him pay for humanity's crimes against Helgen. I'm sure that's not relevant. Nah, just keep shooting them. Don't think about it. Whichever way we go and whatever character we were playing, we inevitably reach the command center and General Adams. The war is over. Without Linty, the attack will come to nothing. But they will be back. Visari will never give up on Vector. <laughs> you don't get it, do you? They see us as the aggressor. They are fighting to claim what we once stole from them. Fighting to prevent another <laughs> imperialist ISA attack on their homeland. Wait, hold on a second. Are we the baddies? This final fight boils down to a trickle of regular infantry and a couple waves of those bodyguards, while your captured friends manage to pretty easily uncapture themselves and join the fight. The last wave opens your way out, and this way should pass you by Adams in perhaps the most blink and you'll miss it boss fight in history. Use a grenade by the way, it gets you an achievement. And then making for the shuttle as the platform begins to fall apart, Haka becomes trapped while trying to disconnect a fuel line, and Rico finally learns the meaning of Christmas or whatever. I thought I'd die fighting side by side with bald fuck. They'll send more forces, won't they? The Hellgast, I mean. Yeah, they will. And we'll be there to meet them. And that was Killzone 1. Honestly, I was surprised how much I enjoyed replaying this. There are problems. The AI, enemy variety, and some visual issues probably chief among them. Now I already touched on the graphical limitations regarding colour palette and the environments, but on the flip side, character models are pretty great, facial animations right down to the subtleties of a smirk or an eye twitch are pretty impressive, you know, especially compared to the last PS2 game I played on this channel. And do I need to go into the actual designs again? The Hellgas Trooper is iconic. Yes, for all of their specific historical influences, they're a little too similar to characters from a certain Japanese franchise from the 80s and 90s, who also happen to wear fascistic black armour, gas masks and red glowing goggles, but, you know, convergent evolution. It's entirely possible that two design teams drawing from similar historical sources to reach similar conclusions without necessarily chalking up to plagiarism. Same, I'd like to think, would go for if it turns out somebody else made an obscenely long video whose premise is identical to mine before me. I certainly wouldn't have known about it when I started, and I'd hope that the content and discussion itself would be different. But even if not, what can you do? But really, what are the odds of that? 
As for the AI, this is not my area of expertise. The extent of my knowledge on anything relating to NPC behaviour is GEC and Creation Kit AI packages and nav meshing for Fallout and Skyrim. However, reading a document written up post launch by Gorilla's own AI programmers, I think I get what they were trying. Yeah, NPCs would routinely run into gunfire or sit in strange locations with seemingly no cover, and just in general behave a bit. dense. Time restrictions were a component limiting how much they could do, but ultimately they had to create an AI for both a linear single player game and for multiplayer bots, capable of responding to a dynamic, player filled open map with objectives moving and changing all the time. Rather than spend time they didn't have creating two separate AI packages, both halves of the game used the same multiplayer based procedurally generated system. The AI is basically left to decide itself where it reckons the best place is in any given moment, based on distance and line of sight to where it thinks the enemy is. With that in mind, the behaviour starts to make a bit more… sense, if that's the right word. This guy, crouched in an empty room, figured it was suitable cover after all. The same document admitted that maybe if they could they should have created level specific AI, but besides requiring a totally different system for the multiplayer, they'd also have to make four versions for every level to account for the alternate playstyles of each character. In short, Gorilla chose independence in the AI at the expense of a bit of wobbliness. But on the whole, I still think this was a solid game. Some might not like this, but I appreciate the simplicity of the story, especially for a super sci-fi space future. You could easily replace SD platform with, I don't know, the Maginot line and transplant the whole thing into the 1930s. And that's the point. It's meant to evoke the feelings of a true war story, which, if we're being frank, rarely involve galactic extinction events or super weapons. Not that there's anything wrong with galactic extinction events and super weapons, but for this grounded universe, that just wouldn't work. The music is gorgeous and its orchestral grandiosity again helps with the wartime narrative. Dutch composer Joris de Man scored the series up to Killzone 3, also returning for Horizon Zero Dawn, and his work is always phenomenal. My only criticism of the soundtrack is that we never bloody hear it in game, only during cutscenes, giving the combat itself an extra level of blandness that could have easily been avoided. The gunplay is fine, especially for a PS2 game. It has its quirks, the sniping where crosshairs float on a separate plane from the rest of the screen particularly comes to mind, but with a good range of weapons and the ability to carry three at a time, it's pretty fun. And finally, the characters. So besides being the first, briefest and frankly most impactful character of the game, we'll leave Vizari aside for now. I never really loved any of our main playables, Templar always seemed a bit bland, same going for Luger. Rico was Rico, but replaying now they're not nearly as bad as I remember. Oh yeah, Templar and Luger are still bland, but they've reached the kind of acceptable blandness of a war movie protagonist, or the cast of a standalone Star Wars film. Templar in particular does rise to the leader role really well here, and I honestly can't really dislike him. But most of all, Hakka, who I barely remember even having an opinion on before, has really risen to among my favourite characters in the series now. His voice acting is far and away the best of the main cast. His banter and frustration with Rico makes up for the fact that it's, you know, Rico. And his character defining moment with Lente cements him in the role of the thankless dissenter, doing what he believes is best for his people, even if those very people resent and disown him for it. In a game where the Hellgasts are nothing but faceless stormtroopers for a despotic regime, Hakka is the reminder to us and the others that there are real people behind that regime. Boy, I sure hope this isn't the last time he's ever seen or mentioned again in the series. It's unfortunate that over the years the thing Killzone 1 became best known for was being… that game that was supposed to kill Halo. In the run up to Killzone 2's release, Guerrilla's managing director Herman Hulst came out about the comparison, saying that while they can think of worse games to be compared to, they don't like the comparison or want to be labelled the killer of any franchise. When it actually comes to comparing the two games, Halo CE looking and playing fantastic three years before Killzone even released, and then of course Halo 2 dropping the same month in 2004, it's easy to see the claim coming off as a bit tryhard. The sad part is, by all accounts calling it the Halo killer was a Sony marketing decision, rather than anything pushed by the development team themselves. And being a fairly small little known Dutch studio, why would they want that target on themselves? 
Like, I wouldn't sit here and be like, Hey guys, I'm the new... AVG... John Tron. I don't fucking watch YouTube. Who's popular and makes videos like these? Oh. Look. An obscenely long video whose premise is identical to mine released literally just a few weeks before I started editing. Well, fuck my life, apparently. The ISA want to believe that we're evil. Evil. Dictator Vissari has turned by the venom of our old enemy. I said I wouldn't get into the backstory till later. Well, the future is now, old man. I left it till now because Killzone does something interesting with player perspective. It throws us into a conflict with little to go on besides these guys look evil and they're invading our backyard. They got the demonic red eyes, the red, black and white flag, which is just shorthand for bad guys, and Yemen, I guess. And not once, not once does Templar, Luger, Votin, Rico or anybody else ask the question, why are they invading? And therefore, neither does the player. And, of course, what would you expect? I'm sure there were plenty of soldiers in the trenches of 1916 France who questioned why their country had been dragged into war. But when it came to crossing no man's land and hoping an artillery shell doesn't liquefy you, the average bloke isn't worrying about the complexities of European treaties and imperial geopolitics. Rather, in the interests of the war effort itself, it's usually quite the opposite. Dehumanisation of the enemy is practically a necessity of warfare. To demonise the men of the other side as nothing but a uniform, a symbol of an evil to be defeated. While this conditioning is prevalent throughout our own history, from propagandised portrayals of German soldiers as animals in World War I, to the systematic dismissal of civilian casualties in recent years because they were probably working with the terrorists, or any variation on that line of reasoning. It's a means of shielding those doing the killing from the acceptance that they are killing people. People who, on an interpersonal level, are more alike than they could probably otherwise admit. But now, for the first time, I see you are a man like me. I thought of your hand grenades, of your bayonet, of your rifle. Now I see your wife, and your face, and our fellowship. Forgive me, comrade. We always see it too late. This isn't obviously perfect programming, and nobody's saying soldiers are all unthinking automatons and capable of empathy, but it's almost a defence mechanism, a means of dulling the senses long enough to get the job done, to stave the psychological toll off till a later, hopefully more peaceful, time. It's also going to depend on the individual and the depths of the conditioning. Like the most fervent members of the German SS, the average soldier of the Hellgast, at least as presented, have a righteous hatred of the ISA, Vectins, and all of humanity who are not of Helgan. But propaganda isn't some scary tool only of totalitarianism. Our heroes are just as susceptible to their own biases in programming, and to see that we need look no further than Rico's, perhaps over the top, hatred of Helgans. Fuck! But as memeable as it might be, and as little a redemptive arc as he does go through with Hakka by the end, this xenophobia, and there's nothing else to call it, comes from somewhere, and it's hardly likely he's the only victim who feels this way. These attitudes don't develop in a vacuum, after all. Looking at her, I realized she looked almost pretty. Pictures of Hellgast women I'd seen at home made it seem like they were all in the final stages of radiation poisoning. They had ghostly white skin, and white scalp shone through oily, bedraggled hair. Some of the more lurid illustrations even showed them toothless or with rotting teeth. This one, though. Her skin was paler than that of the women I was used to seeing, but otherwise she looked like any other human. I glanced at the dead assault infantrymen with new eyes. Were they brother and sister? Husband and wife? So, the Vectans hate the Hellgast, and the Hellgast hate the Vectans. But okay, why? History time! As we know, the Killzone universe is based on our own world a few hundred years from now. But it all starts with the end of the world. 2055, World War III. Resource scarcity leads to an all-out war between the nations of the world, with nuclear weapons ultimately used by the end of a four-year conflict. Unfortunately, the world just becoming Fallout would be the easy way out. Instead, once the dust settles, enough of civilization and government institutions remain to realize that humanity has kind of screwed itself in its home world and if they hope to survive, need to start looking beyond. By 2060, a coalition of the wealthiest governments and corporations from the United Colonial Nations with the goal of finding resources outside Earth. 
Over the next three decades, the UCN developed ships capable of traversing deep space, propulsion systems capable of reaching near light speeds, cryotechnology to allow deep sleep, and the infrastructures required to actually colonise potentially habitable planets. To do all this on limited time, money and resources, the UCN encouraged private enterprise to engage in their own colonisation efforts, and among them, an energy and industrial mining conglomerate named the Helgan Corporation. The early 2100s saw the first pioneering ships leave Sol to establish colonies on other worlds, but the biggest breakthrough came with the discovery of two potentially habitable worlds in the relatively close by Alpha Centauri system. While the UCN would often open colonisation rights to private bidders, they deserved this discovery for themselves, deeming it a strategically important launching off point for further expansion, and in 2116 sent the ill-fated colony fleet Omen to the system, which would lose contact during the journey. The 2110s also saw the formation of the United Colonial Army, the military branch of the UCN for policing the fledgling colonies. While colonies did maintain their own militias, the UCA represented the power of Earth itself, which, being all but stripped of its own resources, required these colonies as a lifeline. With the loss of the Omen fleet and unable to fund a project of such a scale again, the UCN was forced to open colonisation rights to private enterprise, with, of course, Helgan Corporation winning out. HC sent its own ships on the nine-year journey, and upon arrival, named their new worlds. The first, a barren, toxic hellscape, which, in a moment of buyer's remorse, they realised would be barely habitable, although exceptionally rich in energy resources, and they name it, rather unimaginatively, Helgan. The other world, however, is nothing like the first. An Earth-like planet of verdant fields and snow-capped mountains, blue oceans and lush jungles. Setting up shop across this new world, they name it after their CEO, Philip Vecta. Boosted by Helgan's incredible mineral wealth, and as a fueling hub for all UCN ships passing through to the outer colonies, the now Helgan Protectorate enters a Platinum Age, self-sustaining from its seat of power on Vecta. A symbol is adopted for this new colonial government, based on that of the corporation that established it. Three interlocking arms representing peace, freedom, and justice. It's my new empire! Your new empire? Meanwhile, a new colonial peacekeeping entity is founded, Separate but subservient to the UCN, the Interplanetary Strategic Alliance, or ISA. Finding that communication with and manning such distant colonies a logistical nightmare for the UCA, the Alliance allowed for a more decentralised defence, with equipment and training provided by the UCA while volunteers and funding comes directly from local governments, in a mutual defence agreement, with the one big caveat being that Earth and the UCN remain the supreme authority over a planet's ISA branch not that local government. With a vector on the upswing, while the UCN struggled to finance its sprawling empire, the Helgans successfully pressure the government to buy the system outright. While still obligated to send resources to Earth, this new level of self-governance allowed the Helgan administration to effectively tax any UCN ships using its services, reinvesting this wealth into its mining operations and to its militia. In real-world terms, the closest thing I could compare this situation to would be the East India Company. A corporate entity, officially subject to the British Empire, but who ended up with so much control over territory in India, as well as having their own private navy and military, that they, a corporation, would begin levying taxes against the population within its territory. While in this historical example this company was broken up by the government, what came next in the 2190s would be like if the East India Company instead seceded from the empire to form its own country. Concerned over Helgan's monopoly on space travel, the UCN responds with increased taxation of its own colonies to fund a rapid expansion of its own naval forces, heavy cruisers outmatching anything the colonies, ISA or Helgan could match, while also simultaneously rescinding Helgan's own right to field a navy. With tensions high and negotiations failed, Helgan declares independence from Earth and attempts to expel Earth-loyal ISA forces from Vecta. This marks the beginning of the first extrasolar war. Spoilers, it doesn't end well for Helgan. The ISA, probably with support from neighbouring colonies like Gear and with the backing of the untouchable UCN Navy, defeat the Helgan Uprising with some heavy-handed tactics, including an orbital bombardment of Vecta itself, which, in the end, forces the Helgan authorities to surrender. The local ISA takes control of Vecta, while loyal citizens are shipped in from Earth to displace and pacify the unruly locals. While there are a few hints at other conflicts occurring in the Killzone timeline referenced in future games, never again is Earth's authority challenged so openly again. This surrender did not bring peace, of course. 
The next few years saw terrorist activity from Helgan loyalists against the occupiers, and despite still being the majority demographic, the installed ISA governor clamps down on the Helgan population with harsher policing and controls. After a few years of this, dissident Helgans pull together resources, including old colony ships, and leave Vecta to resettle on Helgan in a massive resettlement program known to future Helgans as the Exodus. Preferring not to foot the bill for a doomed colonisation effort of a toxic hellscape, the UCN permits the Helgans to basically do what you want, getting around the legal blowback of sending tens of thousands, maybe millions, to their deaths by declaring Helgan a sovereign nation. As far as the UCN was concerned, they weren't Earth's problem anymore. Fast forward a century, however, and to everyone's surprise, Helgan clings on. Electrical storms ravage the surface, the increased gravity makes even daily life challenging, and the atmosphere brings about radiation sickness and illnesses like lung burn force the use of respiratory masks when outdoors. Mortality rates skyrocket, deformities and hair loss become prevalent, and starvation is common. Yet Helgan perseveres. Third generation colonists prove far more adapted to the world than the original settlers. Body strength has increased to cope with the gravity, and the air is almost breathable although by this point the use of masks has become cultural, particularly as a symbol of the working class. If we ever see a Helgan without the mask, this is usually a sign of wealth or upper class status. Look at those bougie fucks. Knew there was a reason I never liked them. Settlements around the coast and the river Corinth unite to form the city of Purus, named for the King of Epirus of classical Greece, and the military term forebodingly associated with him. Meanwhile, a vast industry of mining, particularly the energy-rich mineral petrosite, re-establishes Helgan as a world of significance. Attempts are made to reintegrate Helgan with the ISA or other interplanetary communities, but the Helgans, fiercely independent and paranoid of outsiders, reject all offers. Hexit means Hexit and all that, but still, relying on its energy export, trade with the outside remains on unfavourable terms. Despite its incredible wealth and resources, sanctions and a lack of bargaining power ensure that the common Helgan sees very little benefit. Then, in 2307, over a century since the first extrasolar war, Scholar Vasari is born. Helgen enters a long economic depression during the mid-2300s, with blame laid at the greed of the ISA, Vecta, and their own administration's weakness. These conditions brew resentment, but for Vasari, a man born into a wealthy industrialist family with natural charisma and skills as an orator, this provides an opportunity. The rise of Vasari is the turning point for the Helgan nation. We'll discuss the specifics of his ideology later, but to the people of Helgan he carried a simple but powerful message. That through their unique hardships, the men and women of Helgan had become more than human. Extra human. And this, their superior race, was dubbed by Vasari the Helgast. News of Vasari's successful coup sent waves across the known universe. In a vecting classroom, Thomas of Jenko's modern studies professor excitedly shared the news that morning, though the politics of some third world planet whose last relevancy on the universe was over 150 years ago barely registered on the average Vecton. Meanwhile, reports from the Vecton ambassador in Pyrus, Sepp Harkin, gave enough concern to the ISA that any number of worlds, not just Vecta, could be attacked by this new militant Helgan. Yet for all this rhetoric, Vasari was not reckless. Granted the title of Autarch by the Helgan administration, Vasari began a 10-year program of rearmament. The three arms of the Helgan Corporation were transformed, co-opted, to the three-pronged triad of the Helgast. Peace, freedom and justice became duty, obedience and loyalty. And the most loyal Helgast, or at least the most influential and obedient, were appointed to lifelong senatorial positions. This senate in turn making Vasari a public promise before the Helgan nation. Proclaim the lost territory of Vecta and be declared the first Helgen Emperor. The aforementioned Subjenko told in the Killzone Ascension novel how his tensions waxed and waned over the next decade, guys like him, straight out of college or high school, would sign up, expecting war to come any day now, only for months of drills to pass for their incident, and for things to once again return to a state of apathy. While the threat seemed serious enough for the ISA to construct space defence platforms around Vecta, to the mind of the average person, the Helgast, what a paper tiger. Vasari was all talk, and eventually his people would see through him and everything could go back to normal. We can go back to brunch. Considering what normal, the status quo for the past century meant for Helgan, anyone should have seen that that was never an option. But you're wondering what my point is. Am I saying from all this that the Helgast are the good guys, actually? 
that they were right to invade, that the ISA are bad, actually, and that really we should be cheering Vasari's military machine along. This is, after all, an incredibly common talking point from fans of the series. But let's not forget that there are two perspectives here. And for the Vectans, not wanting to be genocided is valid. Guerrilla aimed to create a conflict evoking a Second World War tone, yet include the nuances of modern reassessments, though by no means should we limit this to just World War II. There are very few events in human history which are truly black and white. Some perspectives people are shielded from or ignored, facts cherry-picked, some propaganda accepted while others are rejected. And at the end of the day, I've always taken this to be what Killzone wants to instill in the player. Uncertainty. In fact, Killzone could be seen as a brilliant example of unreliable narration. I find it particularly interesting that while every game in the series, with the exception of one, opens with the Hellgast perspective, be it a speech or a narration, yet every other moment of these games are spent grounded in the ISA, the game relentlessly screaming at the player, these are your enemy, kill them now. But it works, either accidentally or truly and brilliantly insidiously, by never admitting to its unreliable narration. It counts on the players themselves to break their own conditioning, to see this entire conflict for the bullshit it really is. But then, who is right? Who deserves to live on Vecta? If you're expecting from me some correct, objective answer, that kind of defeats the point of the game. Are the Hellgast good guys? No. Definitively not, ignoring even the fictitious version of the ideology they represent. From the simple mathematic human cost, their invasion outweighs the harm of the status quo, at least in the short term. Problem is, this same argument also applies to Earth's original seizure of the planet from the Hellgans. Can historical wrongs be used to counterbalance those in the here and now? If so, how far back? If not, then how recent? And you can probably see the rabbit hole this ends up becoming. If the Zari's regime is evil, which there certainly is cause to believe, Re then what is good? A return to the material conditions prior to his rise to power? Those same conditions which facilitated a fascist to take power in the first place? No. Then is good a return to before the ISA annexed Vecta from its original inhabitants? Sounds fair, but how besides invasion, deportation or genocide could this good be achieved? Is it possible instead that there is no good here, just different degrees of evil? Or does opposition to a greater evil automatically donate the lesser as good? Both? Neither? Or does the entire exercise of speaking in these terms not even matter? There will be a reckoning. Skull knows this. Vector will be ours. The civilians will not be killed. We will give them a chance to leave. And if they choose to stay, that is a different matter. The planet is ours. We were there first. In December 2004, one month on from the release of Killzone, Guerrilla Games signed an exclusive development contract with Sony, immediately beginning development of a new Killzone title for the upcoming PlayStation Portable. And the following year saw both big news for the company and big controversy. Somehow, and to the horror of the development team watching from Amsterdam, a pre-rendered animation for an at this stage purely conceptual future Killzone intended only for internal reference was presented by Sony on stage at E3 as real-time in-game footage running on a PS3. While the team had been working on a second PS2 entry alongside their PSP spin-off, the combination of this PR disaster and the surprising enthusiasm for the non-existent game caused them to quickly shift focus towards the upcoming PlayStation 3. While the growing dev team began work in earnest on this PS3 entry, 2006 saw the release of Killzone Liberation on the PSP. Here's the thing though, I've never actually played Liberation before, cause I don't have a PSP. I tried, mind you, I checked in with friends to see if anyone had one I could borrow, and buying, even secondhand, is just too expensive for me to justify. Having tried everything short of sticking my head out the window and asking random passers-by if they have one, not playing will just have to continue. Although... Hey, does anyone have a PSP? I have a Game Boy. Hmm. I have another Game Boy. Okay.
Liberation continues the battle for Vecta in the immediate months after the defeat of the Third Army. Vasari appoints a general, Armin Mitrak, to command the invasion following Lente's death, and within a few weeks manages to establish a stronghold on Vecta's southern continent, including the city of Deortum, at this time being besieged by Colonel Kratik. But that is a good story. For, for another time. time. Fresh off of blowing up the SD platform, Jan Templar is dropped into combat at the ISA weapons base at Rehoven, currently under assault. Unlike the original, and really the rest of the series, Liberation is a twin-stick shooter, making use of the PSP's control setup with a crouch cover system and the ability to lock on and switch between targets, and it all works generally well. Albeit, it took me some time to get to grips with playing it on my, you know, abomination. Fair warning though, it is ball-breakingly hard, and you're going to die. A lot, during certain missions, and of course any time the targeting system decides to be fucky, but overall, first impressions… I'm impressed. Also ragdoll physics. Anyway, we got Luger on the radio telling us to rendezvous with Rico at the end of this trench line. Wow. Everyone's here. I don't feel so good. Several deaths from SMG souls and my guy's constant need to reload later, we finally reach Rico, who's shaved, you bald fuck. After healing him up from a sniper shot, we get him as a squad mate, which in this game means we can actually issue orders. These can be simple, from targeting a specific enemy or moving to a position, though there's also situational orders like using mounted turrets, disabling traps, or planting C4, or do those things yourself and have him cover you. However, as introduced to upon meeting Rico, you are responsible for keeping them alive, with a limited supply of health syringes and automatic mission failure on death. However, healing items, as well as C4, grenades, weapons and ammo, can all be found in these supply crates, which we'll periodically come across. I say scum, take them down! Rico! Shit! With the Hellgast overrunning the base, we're first told to clear this landing pad of an AA gun before being sent to retrieve three VIPs from around the base, requiring different tools, mostly C4, to get through obstacles, and it's a more explorative, puzzly type gameplay, which this game will sometimes have us do. Season desist. The first VIP is a scientist, Evelyn Batten, who, like all these civilian NPCs, we need to escort back to this waiting ISA dropship. This is the only game this vehicle exists in, by the way, and it's whatever. Captain, you must get me to safety. It's a matter of national security. Captain, you must get me to safety. I've shit me back. The final VIP, General Stratson, tells us that a demolitions team responsible for destroying the base's weapon cache failed to check in. And before pulling out, those armaments, including nuclear weapons, need to be prevented from falling into Hellgast hands. So, off we go. We can commandeer a Hellgast tank and smash our way through the next level, before being forced out on foot to take on a tank ourselves. This was... annoying. Mostly just down to targeting malfunctions, but whatever. We destroy the weapon storage elevator and meet up with Rico again via boat to make our escape. Meanwhile, we discover that the VIP dropship has been shot down, probably in a kind of being fucking lane. So we're dropped off along the coast near the drop site. Of course, Rico also happened to drop us on the one patch of coast which happens to be a fucking minefield. Thanks, mate. A lot of trial and error here, with me honestly getting pretty frustrated at the constant inevitable damage. Even using the sniper, you'll need at least three shots to kill any fucker, meaning even one on one, they're always going to get a few shots off for every one you do, chipping away at your health. Had this one door keep spewing out a single trooper every time I walked past it, forcing me to backpedal to cover, try to aim and hit him before a spray of bullets comes my way, then rinse and repeat. And god forbid you try to use the one and only available automatic weapon. Using the STA-52 in this is literally just that Looney Tunes gag where every bullet inexplicably misses leaving a human shaped outline on the wall. You know the one. Well, at least we've learned the Hellgast spider mines don't discriminate in their targets. I'm guessing they made the same mistake the Red Army dog trainers did in World War II. Yet you need to train them against ISA uniforms, specifically. You get me? After a bit of back and forth to unlock the way, we infiltrate an oil refinery blocking our path, with the goal of disabling its water cooling pumps to open the emergency exit way out. Meeting an old friend along the way, who's more of a bullet sponge than ever. We escape to the harbour where we're to do some sneaky stealthing to- You can't hide oh, forever! Fuck. 
Sneaking past these guys prevents reinforcements, but I'm not convinced it's worth the hassle. Bald fuck Rico rejoins us to assault the docks, to both secure transport onwards to the crash site, and to pad out this game with the exact same order of level environments so far- wait, really? Hold on. Trenches, military base, industrial blair, coast, docks. If the next area is a swamp, I swear to Goma! Clear the rest of the docks, eventually reaching the gate where Metrak and his right hand man, Colonel Tendon Kobar, were seen leaving through, and apparently oblivious to the ISA assault happening a couple hundred feet from them. I don't know. But Rico takes some trips to go after him while we go looking for transport. Now, the weapon situation in this game is beginning to frustrate me. Only able to carry one at a time means that a shotgun, ideal for most of the level where cover is plenty, combat is close and enemies frankly need the stopping power, as soon as you hit a place where enemies are more than spitting distance from you and there's no cover between you and them, you might as well have a BB gun. Then at the inverse we have my sniper problem earlier, where while it has range, its damage and rate of fire are so low they'll have closed whatever distance you had long before they're actually dead. The M82 is… okay. Right up until the moment anything tankier than a regular trooper shows up, at which point you'll be spending multiple magazines per kill. I don't mind that different weapons have their different uses, it does encourage constantly mixing up your loadout. I just wish I didn't need to keep praying for a crate after this encounter, because the weapon I'm currently stuck with is a total liability. Simply having the ability to carry a second weapon would be fine. Like the tank fight earlier, I need this rocket launcher to be able to do anything against the tank. But what do I do when an SMG asshole suddenly appears out of this door at my back? Guess I'll die. Wait, a revolver? The perfect balance of range, accuracy, stopping power and rate of fire? Okay, the game's fixed now. Aboard Metrak's docked command ship, we do some business with the big iron on our hip, while Hellgast specialists attempt to detonate charges to prevent it and any intel aboard from falling into ISA hands. If yeah, never try melee by the way. Ah. Incidentally, aside from being assholes, the design of these specialists seems more in line with the… what I'll guess I'll refer to as Phase 2 Hellgas infantry. More modular looking helmet and mask, generally better armoured and equipped. We'll be seeing this trend into Game 2 and especially 3, and just found its presence here interesting from both an in-universe and certainly real-world visual design change perspective. Eventually, in a docks level somehow even longer than the original games, we steal a hovercraft and take off to the… Swamp. They, they did. They did it. They did it. It's a, it's a fucking swamp. We get another vehicle section. It's not as fun as the last one. Mine's lasted a solid ten seconds before disintegrating. Then it's back on foot. Haven't talked about this yet, but the enemy AI is surprisingly good this time around. Use of cover, grenades, suppression, different unit behaviors with. Yes, SMG assholes or bald tanks rushing you out of cover while regular infantry or snipers wait to pick you off. I was reminded to talk about it here when this sniper who, after missing me with my strategic zigzagging, went for the explosive barrel I was passing by instead. The AI does provide a substantial challenge. It's just a shame the spider mines weren't as well programmed. <laughs> General Metrak has been expecting you. Look out! Scatter! Suck on this, you asshole! You cannot pet the dog and kills on liberation. Speaking of challenge, the next level sticks us in a chase along this trap laden mountain trail, with a constant stream of hell gas behind us. It can be frustrating, especially upon hitting the flame trooper blocking your way who absolutely will not die. The amount of fucking times I tried to get through this guy, grenade him as soon as he appears, rush him before he can flame the entrance, command Rico to get him, snipe him from the ridge… he's the fucking worst. As soon as those flames go up, it acts as a smoke screen so you can't even target him. 
and he'll just keep making more. Forever. Or at least until his buddies show up from behind and fuck us in the ass. Seriously, disregard anything I said earlier about Hellgas being people too, about humanity behind the mask or uniform. That thing has no humanity. It scares me. Until now, the game has always rewarded patience, use of cover, careful positioning, waiting to take your shots. But this whole section is just us being screamed at to keep running or die. Fuck! At the end, we find the dropship. VIPs captured and pilot wounded. Rico disappears to locate medical supplies, and we're immediately ambushed and forced to make our escape alone. We acquire a jetpack to hop across these cliffs while I completely screw up the targeting system on this thing. And at the end, we locate one of the VIPs. Sir, are you okay? Save your breath, Becton. Cobra. Colonel Cobra, High Commander of the Colonial Guard. I have a message from General Metrak. He made a deal with one of your kind. You don't go any further, and we don't kill any more hostages. This is a final warning. You son of a bitch. That mech does not look fun to ride in. We pursue Kopar's mech to an outpost where General Stratton's being held, passing through a fuel depot to where- Ah, oh, god damn it, not you again! After taking down a pair of AA guns, we reach a courtyard where we get... The worst fight. Just... The worst. Now, I happily sacrificed myself the first few times just to try to gauge exactly what it is I'm supposed to be doing. But after a few rounds of zero damage indication, no real direction, and the triple threat of constant missile splash damage, grenade spam, and an instant death chain gun, I wasn't getting much of a chance to figure anything out with an average lifespan somewhere in single digits. Cover is limited with these crates being destructible, and whether in cover or on the move, the splash damage will still get you. In the rare half seconds I was in cover and not exploding, I did try to target hard points, specific weapons, or something, anything. But even under normal circumstances, the targeting system of this game is a bastard. Maybe it's because I'm not using an actual PSP, but targeting quickly and at the thing I want first time, as well as targeting while strafing, were things I just struggled with throughout my entire time with this game. But that struggle becomes a fucking death sentence here, where missiles are landing at my heels, or spider mines are swarming me, and I'm having to stop, drop, turn, aim, and shoot at hard point, and then keep running before I'm invariably launched off the side of the fucking map. Say I've taken down the chain gun, and now the spider mines become a threat. My intention would be to shoot the little fuckers before they get too close, but instead the targeting system keeps locking me onto a missile launcher, and now I'm absolutely screwed. With the exception of maybe Killzone 2's finale on highest difficulty, this has to be the most painful moment of the entire series, at least in my experience. Even so, here I'll give you my strategy. First phase, just use all the frag grenades against the chain gun. In retrospect, it might have been more sense to save these for the spider mines, but my priority at this point is getting rid of that thing as soon as possible, and it's the only hard point you'll actually hit with the splash damage. Grenades won't destroy it, but it's damaged enough now for 5 or 6 sniper shots to take it down. Now this does mean relying on that fucking targeting system, but for breathing room, turns out missiles will almost always overshoot you if you stick to the bottom railing, and grenades won't reach you, meaning the gun is really the only issue. I said almost always. Once the gun's down, you should be chipping away at every other hard point when you can, at least until the next phase, where spider mines become the biggest threat. They've, They've only got, got literally, literally two, 2 HP, HP so, so pick a weapon with rate of fire, fire over damage, damage, and assuming you survive the first wave, you can start targeting their spawners. From here, it's just a juggling act of doing all of the above at once. Avoiding missiles, taking pot shots, clearing mines. You just have to pick your targets and focus on them based on threat level. Two mine spawners are deadly because you'll get swarmed, but one is manageable. While missiles are hilariously inaccurate, all it takes to kill you is one unlucky shot, so given the lack of checkpoints, you'll want to stop ignoring them if you've gotten this far. But really, that's it. Not to make it sound too simple, while this is hardly the most difficult routine to figure out, it still took me about 30 fucking attempts to get it right. Give it up, Kobar. Where are the other hostages? <gasps> Metrak knows your plans. The ISA is betrayed again. Don't make me shoot. We have your weapons. You can't win. Death to... 
That's the only way to handle a mad dog. With Stratson alive, he orders an airstrike on Metrak's base of operations, discovered to be somewhere in the- Wait, let's run through the level order. Trenches, base, industrial beach, dock, swamp, hilly, rocky, riverish, base again. I'm calling Snoke up the mountain base. Yep. Luger ends up joining us as we infiltrate the base to rescue hostages, including Dr. Batten, and locate the stolen nuclear weapons mentioned by Kobar. There's another new enemy type here with these heckin' chonkers. Right now they're not really a problem with Luger able to keep their attention while we flank, but one on one they're a real pain in the ass. Really just a stand in for the pyro earlier as an enemy who isn't really a threat, but just in the way. We break into the main base and Yan basically tells Luger to get lost, except literally. Get lost. Rude. Then we begin our sneak through the compound to try and rescue the prisoners. I realise we're at the 11th hour here, so this should be expected, but this was the point in the game where virtually every encounter had become consistently challenging. Each fight became a test of timing, positioning, equipment management. Not complaining, like, I'm dying 27 times for every inch of ground I take, but it never feels unfair. Jesus to get Christ, Luger! I don't know, maybe warn me before you go running at me waving an SMG around? We're meant to defend Luger while she hacks this terminal, and even just being the two dudes who attack us, it's really weirdly difficult and took a bunch of different attempts and approaches. Hey, that worked. Damn, it's not working. Basically, this Hotline Miami trial and error became my life from now till the end of the game. But that's okay. This type of challenge does have a certain appeal. Back on our lonesome, we head through a prison wing, only to be stopped by Frank Blimmin Horrigan. It's not nearly as bad as the Kobar fight, just a circular arena around his raised platform, but with ramps making it a one-way system. There's imperfect cover all over the place from which to take pot shots at him while his gun cools down. But I have to say how much I appreciated the moment when after making my first circuit back to the start of the arena, where you think you found the perfect spot to lay into him by this door, it opens. Shit. Back here. We head through to the butcher's lair from Diablo where Dr. Batten's being held, and releasing her, she lets us know that Rico's here too. There's some more optional stealth here with Evelyn following till we need to grab a keycard from a nearby specialist. <laughs> With the keycard, we're able to gain access to the base's airfield, where another keycarding specialist is running for a waiting fighter, where, if he escapes, we'll be screwed. Of course, I didn't quite understand what was happening the first time, so second try, just don't even let him spawn. Once again, may I just say what a fine-looking vehicle that is. It's like if a Sukhoi 47 and a Nighthawk had a kid. And oh no, I just found the concept art. Ah. Mm. What? Planes are cool. Also, is that sexy nose art I see? I can't tell what it is, but I choose to believe the Hellgast have hazmat suit wearing pinup gals. It's canon, fuck you. We tell Evelyn to stay in that cockpit and continue across the airfield, finding Rico captured aboard Metrax dropship. Rico! Well, well, the famous Captain Templar, still trying to win the war single-handed. It will be the death of you, Captain. Go now! I'll follow when I've dealt with him. Yes, sir! Don't worry, Captain. We have big plans for Sergeant Rico. So begins the final boss fight. Sort of, with a multi-face gun fight through the base. I didn't have too much trouble with this one. Again, the biggest hurdle being the targeting system. But with a big iron on our hip and selective use of grenades, we push him back to the final stage, with him in an emplaced gun. But destroying a couple nearby car batteries does that in, so it's just down to who can shoot the other dead first. Templar gives him a chance to surrender, but negotiations are cut short by ISA bombers, and he's shot into a chasm. I mean, I can't say much about Metrak as a villain, but at least he went down better than... With the place exploding because that's how 85% of games have to end, we're given a final run around to get back to the fighter. And I just want to show off this kill because I was really proud of it. There we go. Then, with not bothering to clear the runway of hostiles because it's unnecessary and not worth the hassle, we rejoin Evelyn and take off. Captain Templar, this is Commander Coda. I will be your escort home, sir. Thanks, Commander. The bigger you'll be needed, sir. Word is we're gonna throw everything we have at Helgen itself. Hit him where it hurts. Sounds like my kind of party. Jan, it's Luger. Are you okay? Get lost. I know. We picked up a Hellgas radio message. You know where he is? Uh-huh. But you aren't gonna like it. What, is he dead? Okay then. 
Well, that cliffhanger ending was Killzone Liberation. Okay, this needs some explaining. As it turns out, there was a free DLC in 2007, which, along with online multiplayer support, added the conclusive Chapter 5 of the campaign. Now, unfortunately, despite becoming re-available again for download in 2011, I'm simply not able to access it for my version, and honestly, that makes sense. I don't think this game Bombination has internet access. But, and with footage kindly provided by Zera on YouTube, I can at least tie up a couple of dangling loose threads. We're sent by General Strats into Seda City in Southern Vecta, where we find Rico seemingly working with the Hellgast. Now, of course he ain't, but it seems that Stratzen himself was the one who set him up, while aiding the Hellgast this whole time in their mission to steal an ISA nuke. After street fighting with the remnant Hellgast forces, the General is eventually confronted at the old Vecton Royal Palace, which, how would when the fucking Vecton history did he have time to establish and solve a monarchy? Fuck knows, maybe it's just a themed casino. Either way, the game ends with a mech battle, Stratzen in custody, and some final words from Vasari claiming that the Hellgast have acquired a nuclear weapon and are preparing to defend their homeland from inevitable Vecton retaliation. Pretty good stuff, just wish I could play it. Liberation was a real surprise for me, and being the only non-first person shooter entry in this series, it makes me want to see other spin-off titles set in this universe. An XCOM-style turn-based isometric, or hell, even go all out and make a real-time strategy. The series has more than enough variety in units and vehicles to pull it off, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Liberation, while agonizingly difficult, was a lot of fun for me, and generally received positive reviews on release. When it comes to the story, while I enjoy the continuation and more decisive wrap-up of the Battle of Ecta, and with the DLC, a perfect setup for Killzone 2, it does feel a bit derivative. Choice and order of locations aside, the game's story beats are essentially identical to Killzone 1, only minus any actual characters. The most I can say about Metrak and Kobar as villains is they look cool, really kicking off a trend in Hellgas antagonist designs going forward, but there's nothing really else there. Stratzen, meanwhile, is just another General Adams, only far less developed, and where Adams was motivated out of fear and self-preservation, Stratzen has a generic spiel about bringing order back to Vecta or something. But all in all, these small criticisms don't take away from the enjoyability of a game which makes the most of its portable platform. Years on from the disastrous showcase at E3, the buzz around Killzone 2 and pressure on Guerrilla continued. They were under scrutiny from the entire gaming community, industry, and Sony itself to deliver something passing for what was shown on stage in 2005. Fortunately, the team managed to deliver something even better. With the PS3's launch following hot on the heels of Liberation in 2006, the Guerrilla development team, now twice the size of what it was working on the original Killzone, at around 120 people, ramped up production on its next-gen installment, making best possible use of Sony's hardware to bring the Killzone universe to life on the PS3. February 2009 finally saw the war move from the mundanity of Vecta to the hellscape of Helgan, and with it, from an echo of a World War liberation story to something altogether different. August 2357 marked the beginning of the Second Extrasolar War, but by October, both Lenti's Third Army and Metrak's forces were routed. The fighting continued as late as January the following year, with Helgast's forces still trapped on Vecta trying to secure transport off-world. The situation was deemed stabilised by the UCN, who withdrew their fleet on the condition that the Vecton ISA imposed a blockade on Helgan and cooperated with any Earth investigation into the conflict. Specifically, Vecta was ordered not to pursue any retaliatory action. To the bloodied Vectans, however, this was unacceptable. And September 2358 saw the launch of Operation Archangel, the largest military operation in human history with the goal of ending the Helgas threat once and for all. The operation would be a three-phase invasion of Helgan itself, with the aim of capturing Fazari to be returned to Vecta for trial, the destruction of their offensive naval and military capabilities, and the installation of a pacified, Vecta-friendly regime. And Admiral Alex Gray commanded the first wave, who were expected to swiftly knock out the comparatively outdated Helgas fleets before establishing a beachhead. Then, within two weeks, the main assault force led by now Colonel Templar would push into the pacified capital city, take Fazari alive, and returned to Vecta with the support of the third wave. The ISA were prepared this time. New ships loaned by the UCA, a swell of new recruits fueled by patriotic vengeance, an enemy force said to be demoralised and humiliated from their defeat on Vecta, an undertrained and under-equipped conscript force no match for the professional soldiers of the ISA. In and out, three-week invasion. What could go wrong? Ah. <sighs> <sighs>
My people, sons and daughters of Elgan, this much I vow. The history of these days will be written in blood. By crushing the armies of our enemy, by seizing the weapons they thought to turn against us, we were fighting for our very existence. But if there are those who would deny us peace, refuse us our rightful place in the universe, then we will unleash such terrible vengeance that generations yet unborn will cry out in anguish. A spokesman for ISA High Command had this to say on Vasari's latest outburst. The dictator Vasari plays a martyr while threatening the peace of the Listen universe. Listen to this shit makes me want to break something. Dawn, the Ever the moves. diplomat, Rico. Damn. Colonel Templar. I'm off the field this time. So I'm looking to you and Seb to get it done. You know we're on. Good luck, Sergeant. Sir. The ISA also confirmed that go. the second wave of Dude. the invasion fleet is due to launch imminently. They will arrive in orbit over the Helgan capital in approximately two weeks, by which time Fleet Commander Templar expects the first wave of the assault force to have dealt decisive blows against Vasari's forces. I'm sure we all wish our brave men and women good luck and Godspeed. The time for diplomacy has passed. The Hellgas do not reason. They started this war when they invaded Vector, and it's up to us to conclude it. They sweep over our lands like the sands of winter. Never again will we bow before them. Never again endure their oppression. Never again endure their tyranny. We will strike without warning and without mercy. Fighting as one hand, one heart, one soul. We will shatter their dreams and halt their nightmares. Drenching our ancestors' graves with their blood. We awaken to Klaxon, signalling time to deploy, as we take control of ISA Sergeant Thomas Sevjenko. What I love about this opening aboard the ISA flagship is, especially compared to previous games, just how quiet it is. Ship crew stands around talking, confident about the mission to come. Looking out towards the besieged city below, we learn from our buddy Garza that, much to the dismay of the invasion planners, the Hellgas have a surprise orbital defence system preventing us from dropping straight onto Vizari's front lawn, so the fleet sits out over the coast. But, just a minor inconvenience. If we ignore the shitstorm we the player already know we're wading into, you could almost believe, as they do, that we really do have this in the bag. This intro is telling us specifically that the ISA is not the underdog this time. On our way to the hangar, we bump into Rico and Evelyn Batten, the weapon scientist from Liberation, who's here tracking the stolen Rehoven nukes. Thankfully, though the Hellgast made it off Vecta with only one weapon, Red Dust, they lack the activation code. Still, better to have it back. Eavesdropping also gives us a little more info. You must treat Bizarre professionally, Sergeant Velasquez. His cooperation will be important to our long-term aims. Spare me the fucking politics, ma'am. We have an opportunity to end hundreds of years of antagonism here. A great deal of future history will be decided by how we act on Helgan. History was never my favorite. Let's stick to the here and now. Huh? Well, let's hope that sentiment doesn't come back to bite us in the ass. While we prepare for our incredibly health and safety conscious deployment, we meet our squad. Rico, we already know, Garza, an old buddy of Sev's from even before the war, and Natko, who just swears lots while having a massive hooter. Yoris Demand's score swells beautifully here and continues to add to the optimism, almost patriotism of this invasion, while we descend through the clouds to the flashes of warfare below. In immediate contrast to the serenity above, the opening minutes of combat is just the D-Day scene from Saving Private Ryan. 
Our troops are running up against MGs. Men are calling out for their officers, for their squad mates, while it seems everyone is just scrambling for some kind of direction. This opening is effectively a recreation of the 2005 internal video, though obviously things are different, it being an actual game for one, but with Gorilla surely aware of how easy that comparison would be drawn, it tells me that they were confident that they had met those expectations, and in my opinion, yes. This, even now, 12 years later, is a fantastic looking game, and this opening showcases so much of it brilliantly. I hope you aren't sick of me saying it yet, but I love the vehicles in these games. Plus, they have tracks. See? This game is much more about cover than the first, and that goes both ways. Hellgast, stick to cover, peak, even blind fire, and given how much more mortal you are this time, you gotta do the same. Thunder Punch! Speaking of the lads, they look brilliant, and I love that you can shoot off their helmets. It's a tiny detail, but it's always fun. Having secured the riverside landing, we are to escort our armour column, with seven Garza sweeping the high ground for any threats. I mentioned during Killzone 1 that the most memorable environments were ones recognisable as somewhere people actually live, and that they did learn this lesson. The streets of Purus and Killzone 2 are some of my favourite of this type of environment in a game, honestly maybe only second to Half-Life 2's City 17. From graffiti, whose words and therefore political predilection of the artists are unfortunately unknowable, stacks of newspapers, worn propaganda posters, abandoned street vendor stalls with prices still etched on in chalk, State branded milk crates, and, owed oh, to the industrial and architectural background of many of the game's artists and designers, these streets actually feel like streets rather than video game levels. The designers used Hong Kong as a major reference to give it a sense of unplanned verticality, both great prosperity and great poverty side by side. Shanty towns or favelas where the populace is simultaneously over policed and expected to fend for itself. And of course, a healthy dose of brutalist concrete architecture, with perhaps a hint of Albert Speer and Roman plinths for state structures or the more wealthy districts. Whatever the sources though, the designers were very careful to remove specific cultural signifiers, or de Hong Kongify it as the visual design book put it. But all this together creates a very strong, uniquely Helgan identity to the city. I know that was a bit of a tangent, but we're going to be here for quite a lot of game, and I had to talk about the brilliant job the designers did of making it feel like a real place. Jeffries! Where are you guys stationed at? Northern Beachhead by the capital! I'll send you a cold one when we get this convoy through! I'll hold you to that! Shit! After taking out an entire apartment block, we scout ahead to try and find where that dropship might have landed, arriving only too late to see the survivors being executed. By the time we return to the convoy, we see things aren't going super cash money there either, and it's up to us to clear this floodgate of MGs and RPG troopers. It gets pretty crazy with us trying to defend our tank from enemy infantry while it deals with their armour, and for a brief time we can take control of it ourselves. Eventually, a rocket barrage from our cruisers finishes the job and we are whisked away via our dropship, the open-topped intruder, Chad Overlord, to reinforce a Captain Narville, the ranking officer on the ground, currently bogged down further into the city. As we make one of our only non-crash landings of the invasion, we run across this battlefield to Narvel, who tells us to go take out some anti-air arc towers. The game uses the PS3's wireless controller to add a pretty fun motion control mechanic for certain actions, like the use of demo charges here, or turning valves, which I always find really satisfying for some reason. I mean immersive valve turning! What more do you want? Just us in Garza, we pass through some narrow streets with loudspeakers spouting propaganda from Vazari himself. I said nothing during the intro cutscene, but once again, Brian Cox is perfect beyond words in this role. I'll occasionally just stop and listen to them when out of combat, just for the performance itself. But sprinkling him through the game in this way doubles to remind us of our end goal, and gives him much more of a presence in-game than if he'd just been relegated to the intro again. Then you, my friend, don't go crap about life! And why the fuck are you wasting my two precious hours with your movie? I don't have any use 
for it. I don't have any bloody use for it. Okay, thanks. We get our first encounter with a Hellgast Heavy Trooper, and it's a great set piece. Built up like a boss fight, even though they'll end up being pretty common. Focused fire to the helmet or use of explosives will stun him for a moment, and shooting a tank on his back will... The, the red glowing spot, you, you've played video games before. We meet another unit type, and god damn, it's likely you watch this very video approximately this timestamp, because these shock troopers actually do use rush tactics, rapid fire SMGs, and will even try to knife you in close quarters. Yeah, they look like dorks with their little coats and sidecaps, but at least compared to past games, it seems like there's much more emphasis on personality between the different Hellgas units. Having more than the one voice actor for all of the enemies will do that, but I like the way they snarl and taunt, and I get the impression they were all bullied at school. Bullied by the Chad Grenadiers, and took out all their frustration for why they couldn't get a girlfriend by blaming the victims on message boards or reporting their parents to the secret police for questioning the state. Anyway, on the wider topic of AI, I reckon this game's pretty much fixed it. Units like the Shock Troopers do charge recklessly, but that's kind of their role. Assault infantry use cover, heavies will slowly advance and suppress, and it makes having specialised infantry have a point, with the gradual introduction of them into the mix adding some spice and challenge. After taking out the Arc Tower, we're pursued by an ATAC, the angriest drone you'll ever see, with so much firepower it's a wonder the Hellgas don't just do nothing but make these. Anyway, Seven Garza escape, along with a fragment of the Arc Tower's power source. We meet back up with Rico and Natco, where we're ambushed and forced to hold off several waves of enemies, including an APC from the inside of a fucking building. The absolute mad lads. Back at the square with ISA reinforcements now able to drop in, we take the central platform and hold it against counterattack. I haven't actually spoken about the gunplay itself yet. Similarly to the original, weapons have a real weight to them, and I reckon that would put some people off. It does take a little time to acclimatise to if you're used to quicker, sharper FPS controls, but once you do, it feels and works great, combined with fantastic sound design and sense of feedback. Needless to say, the models themselves all look gorgeous, with slight redesigns, namely the M82 and the SDA-52, veterans from the original. Gotta say, the Style 52 might be the best glow up of the series. I love the look of this much more compact carbine, but it still feels more rudimentary and factory manufactured than the sleeker carbon fibre ISA rifle. On one sour note, I'm not a big fan of them limiting the player back down to just one primary weapon and a sidearm. I mean, no, it's not difficult to find weapons nearby if you want to change, but for a game, I'm happy for the hit to realism if it lets me carry a sniper and an assault rifle along with a sidearm. Having captured the square following a final push by a pair of heavies and an attack from cable cars at our rear, Narvel's convoy is able to move on towards Vizari's palace, seen high above the war-torn city below. Use your damn covering fire! from the rest of our squad, we make our way through bug-infested sewers, eventually sticking upon a pair of grunts discussing a Colonel Radek. Did you hear? Two grunts from our unit got executed by Radek. No shit. What for? Cowardice? Defeatism? Uniform violations. I shit you not. I don't know, sounds pretty chill. There is a ton of fighting to get back up top, with a flamethrower probably being your best and most morally questionable option. Like for absolute real, I felt fucking awful using this. I can barely even bring myself to slap the fire dance music over it. Yep, never using that again. Back with Garza, we're sent to take out some mortar positions, and thankfully your AI companions can't die because goddamn. All units. This is Radic. The defense system is initialized. All positions under weapon under order. Huh. That voice sounds familiar. Though the mortars are down, the convoy is still under fire from a nearby building. So, unable to evict the residents one by one, Garza suggests a few well-placed decharges, giving each one a wee squeeze for luck. Then...
freedom. Hey, better safe than sorry. With all that rigmarole out of the way, we can finally get back to trying to cross the Corinth Bridge, the only route to the administrative district and the palace. It's a hell of a firefight across here, and like so much of this game, just looks great. If I could, I would just go into spectator mode and watch this battle play out between all these different NPCs, the mortar fire, the advancing armour. Love it. Yep. With the bridge secured, we head on to the admin district to secure Radix HQ at the Helgan Military Academy. Though on the way, Seven Garza finds some kind of blown underground conduit containing more of that substance found in the Ark Tower. Though we don't spend long here, the Academy is perhaps one of my favourite locations in the game, just from pure design. After a couple hours trudging through slums, this really drives home the Hellgas prioritisation of military above all else, with even Rico commenting on as much. Look at this place. The rest of the city is a shithole. Figures. Only thing the Higgs care about is training troops. Of course, after fighting through an ambush and raiding Radic's office, we find nobody's home. Well, except for the ATAC, with which we're promptly forced to 1v1 in a fight which can be extremely challenging on higher difficulties, just from the speed of the bastard thing. But trying to keep the only cover between you and it till it flies over these capacitors, you can stun it and get some shots in before it recovers, eventually taking it down. Impressive display taking down that ATAC. Now impress me some more and take point on the convoy. Sir, unidentified object at 12 o'clock. Stop the convoy! Repeat! Stop the convoy! Sir, look out! What the hell's going on? Not sure, sir. Something just came out of the ground. Oh, shit. That thing looks Don't crazy. Don't move any closer until command says so. Forward unit standing by. What are our orders, sir? The weapon performed adequately. This is Colonel Radic. While unlike Lente or Metrak before him, he wears the mask, signifying him as coming from the lower classes within Helgan society. And yet despite this, has become perhaps Fazari's most trusted and loyal instruments, with the defence of the capital itself having been put in his hands. If ever there was a Vader to Fazari's Palpatine, that would be Radic. With the invasion stalled by these perimeter arc towers, Evelyn is able to track the blown pipeline discovered earlier to somewhere in the Badlands beyond the city. So, with the scientist coming along, we're sent out to investigate and disable whatever's powering the defences, revealed by her to be the material Petrocyte, once exported as an incredibly powerful energy source across the colonies, but since Vizari's rise to power, has been hoarded and used to power the war machine. This line of dialogue, by the way, which I honestly missed in every playthrough before this one, might just be one of the most important of the series. Into the refinery village, we come across the bodies of ISA marines, tortured and executed, before bumping into the locals. So, there's a few new enemy types here. First of all, we have a handful of advanced assault infantry, which, as I mentioned in Liberation, are one of a number of newer style units, phase two if you want to use my designation, who function otherwise just like standard infantry, but advanced. Later on, we come across a few snipers who have a far cooler design now. But the most interesting and prominent enemy here are the Hellgast Miners. I'm not sure there is actually a definitive canon explanation for what these are. Guerrilla fighters, civilians pressed into service, but whatever it is, they're not military. Despite military grade weapons, their tactics are noticeably worse than their trained counterparts, usually firing wildly from out of cover. The real question for me, which I honestly don't have an answer to, is whether or not these guys are fighting willingly. Is this a citizen's militia taking up arms against the Vectin invaders, or some civvies drafted at the end of a gun? There's hints pointing both ways, with, on the one hand, combat dialogue saying things like, rise up against the ISA, but on the other hand, there's a later instance of a train driver begging for his life, insisting that he's not a soldier, 
and all this while the regular military can be heard vocalising their contempt for these parasite civilians. Civilian maggot asleep at his console. That's all drunk. Parasites. Frankly, either way though, it makes our actions against them questionable. Also, there's giant spiders. Go on! Dude! That's not very cash money. Hopping aboard a refinery train to follow our squad's captors, we get a lengthy shootout up to the control room where Rico assaults the aforementioned driver before we break into the Geonosis droid foundry. There's another big boy fight here that, while a variant of the heavy, plays out the exact same. However, afterwards, we get access to one of the best weapons in the game, the VC-5 Arc Rifle. What follows is a pleasant little bucket ride while we zap the crap out of everything within range. It's no flamethrower, but I still feel a little bad. Not enough to stop, though. Hey, Sam, check it out. No expert on this shit, but all the pipes from the barons come through here on their way to the city. This here looks like the core. We take this out, the whole thing should be fucked. Yeah, as something of an energy sector process technician myself, that's, uh, that's the word for it. With this intel secured, we now just gotta save our guys, who we find nearby being interrogated by Radek himself. I'm not a very patient man. Do you understand why I'm here? I guess your mom got drunk with the guys one night. You are next. Unless she gives me the nuclear codes. Shit. Ah! Watching from the sidelines, Sev tells Rico to wait until he has them flanked, to just for once not be a big Rico and Russian guns blazing. But as Evelyn insists to the Colonel that only Templar as fleet commander has access to the warhead codes, Rico does. Rico, no! Contract! Kill him! No! Garda! No! Don't let them out alive! We fight our way out to the landing platform, just in time to see Radek's beautifully recreated PS3 quality overlord taking off without us, leaving us to call an Uber and secure the LZ. But with Garza in bad shape after taking a bullet during Rico's charge, he succumbs to his wounds, just as help arrives. I need help now! I need a medic, God damn it! Back off. Back the fuck off. Whoa, take it easy. Rico, just leave it, man. All personnel to backup stations. Repeat. All personnel to backup stations. Shit! What now? Come on! Sir, let's go! Move! Taking an elevator ride to the bridge, we begin seeing the impossible. Hellgast aboard the flagship. Leech pods drilling into the hull, deploying squads of shock troops. I gotta be honest, it's a great moment. This whole level easily being my favourite of the game. That juxtaposition between the safety and assured security of our ship at the start of the game to now is just so good. Watch it! From the bridge, Jan and Evelyn are attempting to strike the petrocyte grid, but damage to the launch bay is stalling them. Things are bad, and we are sent to retake the gun decks so we can start defending ourselves. Besides advanced infantry, who we've already met, this level adds the elite shock trooper, a lean special forces unit who, like regular shock troops, use the SMG knife combo, except... elite. And somehow they got a big boy aboard and all. Reaching the gun deck control room, we get a glimpse of just how much of a cluster is going on out there. Apparently, Admiral Grey's first wave missed a few ships because the Hellgas fleet is here and fucking us. We get a stunning sequence in control of the ship's anti-air defences, taking out leech pods as they're launched from enemy cruisers, as well as more of our favourite Hellgas fighters. To comment on vehicle designs once again, I adore the Hellgas cruiser redesign. There are certain aspects of this ship that have remained consistent throughout all the games, namely the six fanning engines and the long fin out the back. 
but I never much liked the narrow frame we saw before. These things got some bulk though, and those hammerheads. From this angle, they're like a shark or a cruising pliosaur. Love them. And you know what? Let's not look over the ISA cruiser, whose vertical design is so unique and weird, but actually totally viable for a spaceship. I'll say it now, I'll never get tired of space fleet battles. Unfortunately, my comrades probably disagree, as the ISA fleet is being decimated by the surprise raid, and Templar gives the order to abandon ship. Evelyn, we're approaching the grid coordinates. I'll prep the autopilot. Jan? Colonel Templar. Colonel Raddick. This is unexpected. I'd rather we had met in combat. Like soldiers. I agree. But we find ourselves here. Indeed. Now, give me the nuclear codes. The women told me they were here. Well, they are. But my access clearance has been revoked. <laughs> oh, you make her very poor, liar, Colonel. Now give me the codes. Without authorization from High Command, those codes are going nowhere. Do not toy with me. No! Download the code data! With Seb and Natko dragging Rico to an intruder, Jan, in a final act, sets the new sun on a collision course with the Petrocyte energy grid, taking the city's defences down with him. Of course, that doesn't do us a whole lot of good when we crash land somewhere in the middle of the Maelstrom Barrens. I think that makes two for one on dropship crashes. We come across another squad along with a surviving exosuit, borrowing it for the cause. What is it with you? You're looking to be some kind of war hero again? It's over. Your friend Templar. He offed himself and left us all in the shit. Okay, you need to learn some anger management techniques. Controlled breathing or something. Yep, definitely killed a dude. Well, whatever. Just don't murder anyone else today in cold blood, okay, Rico? We get a pretty fun vehicle section in this exosuit as we try to rendezvous with Narvel's marines. For something only intended for a small portion of gameplay, it feels surprisingly good. Far more open and freeform than the short tank section earlier. Who knows, maybe we'll get to use these again someday. Maybe even in multiplayer. Glad to see you're back in action. Now we just need to rendezvous with our platoons in the city, and we're clear to take the palace. I know you guys are pretty down about our friends on the new sun, but we have to concentrate. Oh yeah, the nuke. Somehow completely forgot about that. Knowing defeat was otherwise inevitable and holding it back as a last resort, Vasari gave the order to detonate red dust over his own capital, wiping out the bulk of the ISA invasion force as well as the city's own defenders in a single ruthless act, leaving only Narvel's convoy, Alpha Squad and a handful of surviving cruisers as all that remains of Operation Archangel. Still, with Vasari having played his final card, Sev points out that with nothing else to do but wait for Radix forces to descend on them, the surviving ISA decide to launch an all-or-nothing assault on the now defenceless palace itself. Defenceless being a relative term, of course, with the elite of the elite of Radix forces stationed here and ready for the fiercest fighting of this entire sordid campaign. With an ominous red haze and a mushroom cloud hanging overhead, it's an insane final battle. With everything being thrown at us, from tanks to ATACs to big boys. I only want to talk to you. We're first required to take out the palace's behemoth-sized arc tower, Probably the one that was taking cruisers out from orbit and is right now hindering our reinforcements and the incoming third wave fleet that we'll be needing to get Vizari and ourselves back home. Clear these bunkers, set D charges, squeeze for luck, then it's off to the main event. An inch by inch battle up to Vizari's front door. It's a slog, it's brutal, and it's exactly how it ought to be. This is the culmination of this war and the final dying gasp of the Hellgas regime and the desperation among the last few dozen defenders is felt. But in the end, we make it. Sir, Narco, come on! You guys go ahead, I'll stay out here and keep at bay! Alright man, 
Now go catch a Vizori and end this campaign for us all. Good luck. You heard the man. Let's go get that asshole and make him pay. Palace interior is just as we would expect, and more. Opulent and brutalist, the man's megalomania on full display. Particularly interesting are the paintings within the inner sanctum. A Helgast invasion of Vecta, whether commissioned before the actual invasion or since, who knows. Vizari himself, as a scholar, teacher, self-styled philosopher perhaps. The First War, entirely historically revised of course since the Red Flag and Helgast Triad were only adopted with Vizari's rise to power. Though, while not exactly a reliable source, does give us our one and only glimpse at a Helgan military pre-Exodus. Also, yes, I get the cheeky reference. And lastly, of course, Vizari and the boys. But enough stalling. It's time for the hardest fight in the game. Didn't I kill all of you yet? Cut them off. I'd like to make it known that I have completed this game on hardest difficulty. Look, here's the trophy. You know, before I'm accused again of being bad at games, actually, which, you know, kind of weird given I've never once tried to present myself as anything other than a guy who likes talking about games. You know, I'm hardly a self-styled pro gamer XX Dragon Slayer likes to strive and hit the bell icon. Yep. But I need it to be known that I did complete this on hardest difficulty. Because right now, just for footage, I am playing on easy and it still took me 30 fucking minutes to get through this thing. Kill the first. No bully. What basically follows is a prolonged firefight against waves of troops, starting with regular infantry, then shock troopers, then with anti-tank and spicy boys added to the mix. All while Radic himself takes pot shots at us from the far balcony. Just staying alive and not getting swarmed is difficult enough, but you need to get shots in on Radic any chance you get, who will keep using a cloaking device to reposition after taking so much damage. When the gates to the second level open up, you can at least get some cover at the back end, along with plenty of snipers, grenade launchers, and... I'm so sorry, the flamethrower. I, I know, I said I was never going to use it, but there comes a point. And that point is dying for the ninth time. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not 100% sure how the mechanics of this fight work. Whether phase progression is weighted more on damage to Radic or on wiping out minions. Focusing on the troops seems to be a never-ending endeavour, but at a certain point of damage Radic will just head out completely, and nothing will happen till you kill the one remaining assault troop hiding somewhere on the other side of the map, at which exact moment Radic and five more squads will suddenly reappear before his body even hits the floor. Best policy as far as I can figure it out is probably to get Radic out of action early each phase, then focus on troops. There is a risk of bugging out too, as I discovered, where no new troops spawned in and Radic would just stand there taking damage indefinitely for 10 minutes. Just to be aware of, I guess. Hopefully though, Radic will eventually decide he actually wants to get the knife kill achievement and will start teleporting around the place like a goddamn Super Saiyan. So not a cloak? Actually local teleportation tech. That's like a pretty gigantic fucking deal. Like, no, seriously, can you imagine the paradigm shift such technology could do to transform a society? Industry, economy, transportation, food distribution. On the one hand, I'm pretty disappointed Gorilla would drop in something so hi-fi in its lo-fi setting at the last minute without exploring the consequences, but at the same time, it makes perfect sense that the Hellgast stumble across technology this groundbreaking, and the most they can think to use it for is getting themselves into shanking range a bit easier. Well, I don't need a teleport. I could get into shanking range on my own two legs! As we approach Vazari's throne room, we pass bodies of soldiers, either suicides with the ISA at the gates, or executions by Radek for some infraction. At the steps to his chamber, the interlocked arms of the Helgan Corporation adorn what had once been its administrative centre. And waiting above, overlooking the city he killed, is the man himself. Scholar Vizari! Scholar Vizari, I'm placing you under arrest under Article 27. And who are you, soldier? Savchenko. Sergeant, first class. They send a sergeant to take Vasari? Are your commanders really all so afraid? 
War's over, Vasari. You lost. Really, Sergeant? And who won? The cowards who commanded you and your comrades here to die? The Hellgast have lost nothing. We fight for who we are. We wear our wounds like badges of honor. Helgan is ours, and we will die before we let it fall to plunder us. That is why your leaders dare not make a martyr of you. Your fleet burned, your friends butchered, and you become a hero for saving my life? Does that sound like a victory to you, Sergeant Zevchenko? Son of a bitch. Good men have died, and I'll see you rot a cell for it. You'll pay for what you've done! For giving my people pride, purpose! We have built this great nation from nothing! Take me, and Helgen will dissolve into chaos. The ISA war machine powerless against the sheer will of my people. We will choke the streets with our dead before we surrender. Your masters will beg me to restore order. You have not won. You will not Let go. No! The Vizari dead because Rico just couldn't not Rico their mission and the best chance for lasting peace dissolves then and there. Sev steps out to the palace overlook and looking above sees nothing less than an armada of Helgast cruisers having been kept in reserve on the other side of the planet for exactly this moment bearing down on what remains of the ISA fleet. Their mission failed, their retreat cut off and what remains of their fleet about to be annihilated. This is the end of Killzone 2. I fucking love this game. Killzone 2 was actually my entry into the series, first introduced to it through a gaming magazine. Yeah, remember when people used to read those? Game news? On paper? Weird, right? As some sort of promotional thing for the game's release, it had a whole double page article visualising and detailing the timeline and backstory to the game, and if you can believe it given this video's existence, it was fascinating to me. I got the game that Christmas and for the longest time I ranked it as one of my top 10 personal favourite games ever, and probably my favourite pure first person shooter. Now coming back to it after a good few years, have my opinions changed? Nope. The gameplay still holds me, the universe setting and story still captivate me, the music, need I even say it, is legendary. Hell, it even broke boundaries, earning Yoris Deman an Ivor Novello Award for musical composition, making it the first time a video game won such a thing, which since starting in 1955 had only ever recognised movie scores, TV or conventional songs. Meanwhile, in significantly less meaningful awards, the game itself was awarded with Most Improved Sequel by GameSpot, as well as Best PS3 Shooter from IGN. IGN, people! Wow! An award statue! <laughs> Oh, it's from IGN. Shit. While I could wank off its graphics, visual design, and all the obvious good stuff, there is a few sticking points. Reviews on release criticise the characters and narrative, but to the latter at least, I fervently disagree. Sure, absolutely, the main characters are weak. I mean, Natco, people, swears a lot while having a massive hooter. Has anything happened to dissuade you from that earlier assessment? Garza was the friend. He's chill, he's easy to like, but there's nothing deep there. While his death could be interpreted as a cheap shot at emotion, I don't take it to be about him at all. Looking at his unceremonious casket, wheeled off half-heartedly to a pile, his death is a stand-in for all the casualties from this shit show. He's just another number. Another box. That's the tragedy. The dialogue, at least from our main squad, is pretty bad. Criticisms were made at the time over the excessive cursing and, believe it or not, I kinda agree. Fudged. But at the same time, what? What do you want? Is Rico of all people gonna pause the game to wax poetic about the cycle of violence and the human condition? Probably not. Fuck this. Shit. 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 But on the other side, we have our villains. Colonel Radic, while maybe not the most complex villain, is a step up from the previous games. 
Lente had a bit of character, or at least history with a character we did like in Haka, and Metrak and Kobar looked cool. Radic, meanwhile, is the best of all worlds, with an on-screen presence above any other villain in the series, barring the Kingpin himself. Speaking of Haka, you might have recognised it, but his voice actor, Sean Pertwee, is actually Radek too, and Sean reprised the role again for Sony's 2012 Smash Bros clone, PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. A really dumb game, which, if I'm honest, I only got because he was in it. But I mean, his boss fight was against Sir Daniel for Tesk. What's not to love? One side. I have work to do. Speak clearly. As for the criticism of Killzone 2's narrative, as a war story, it's exactly what it should be, with the conflict itself more than the characters being what goes through an arc. From Oorah, let's kick some ass, Murka said space, freedom, to dejectedly sitting on the steps of the capital, being exactly where you were trying to get from the beginning, but absolutely nothing having been solved. Again, to reuse a point of mine from Killzone 1, the threat of galactic extinction or super laser a compelling narrative does not inherently make, nor does their absence mean a story lacks stakes or impact. And ultimately, that's all I can say. This game impacts me, in a way really none of the other games quite managed to. Even bookended with two of my favourite cutscenes from any video game, period. I'll just say it now since it probably won't come to much of a surprise at the end, but Killzone 2 is my favourite entry of the series. And that's before we even talk about the multiplayer offering. Now you can probably tell for how much I talk about the story and lore of shit, but I'm not the biggest multiplayer guy in the world. Even so, I love this game's multiplayer. Called Warzone, it could throw up to 32 players into a playlist of randomly selected missions, which constantly change up the objective of the moment. Holding down propaganda speakers, which will be turned to your side, or a capture the flag take on the same speaker idea, planting C4 on enemy held objectives, simple body count and get more kills, or my favourite, assassination which will pick a random player from either side, marking them for death by the other team and putting their own on bodyguard duty. Each class has their own abilities, my favourite probably being the sniper, with a movement sensitive cloaking field that breaks if you run or take a shot, but every class is viable. The tactician spawns attack drones, the medic, medics, the engineer is a happy boy with his happy turret, the saboteur is a spy and assault has heavy weapons. Unfortunately, for all my love of this game mode, there is a glaring problem. The servers were shut down in 2018. Thankfully there is an offline version called Botzone, which obviously is where I'm getting this footage, but even that is fun. At least the AI plays the objective, which is more than I can say for some human teammates. It wouldn't be enough for a competitive individual, but if you'd finished the main game and weren't quite ready to stop playing yet, this could scratch the edge. So, I've made it clear that I adore Killzone 2, but going beyond just the gameplay, the graphics, or even the story or richness of the lore, I've realised in replaying the series in its entirety that what makes this one work best for me is that it successfully balances its dumb fun sci-fi nonsense with its more serious thought-provoking themes. Future games, in my opinion, would never quite hit this balance again, but we'll come to them when we do. Regarding said themes, cyclical violence and war bad are here and Okay, that's pretty part and parcel with any war story. But more so than most games who maybe pay lip service to why violence is wrong before going off to save the world by committing grievous bodily harm to a final boss, YOU'VE KILLED ME! Killzone 2 commits to the idea, leaving our heroes, our villains, and the universe itself worse off by the end. I wanted to very quickly do the forbidden thing and compare this game to the Halo series, which I've been playing through on Steam for the first time recently. Taking Halo Reach in particular, this is a game which presents a horrible, devastating war, whole levels dedicated to showing things like civilian casualties, and a great big surface level isn't war bad. But after a steady stream of main cast members sacrificing themselves heroically for the cause leading up to its intentionally tragic climax and final word about how it was all worth it in the end, having been so submerged lately in Killzone's far more cynical content, I couldn't help but notice the contrast. Reach borders on glorification of war, or at the very least on that element of heroism and the need to sacrifice one's life heroically for a cause, with the epilogue all but hitting this point home. Brilliant game, for the record, just incredibly po-faced and bland characters. Killzone has its heroic sacrifices and tragic deaths too, but how does it handle these? One is subverted entirely by having the sacrifice backfire, only escalating things as a cornered enemy is forced towards the nuclear option, 
and the other death is entirely and intentionally meaningless. Not to mention was caused by the avatar of the ISA's shoot first, ask questions later attitude himself, and as to whether the death and destruction was all ultimately worth it in the end, no. Besides a general anti-war stance, hubris, asymmetric warfare, and how technological superiority can fail in the face of a misunderstood and underestimated place or enemy, also known as the Ewok effect, are all pretty heavily present themes. All this is why, for me, Killzone 2 is just more interesting than the previous games. Taking this series as an allegory for World War II, the Hellgas as Nazis, Vecta as a stand-in for the Rhineland or its neighbours, is… fine. But taken literally, transposed one to one, is ultimately kind of boring. Yes, during development of that first game, this was the intent. But by the time of this sequel, that scope had expanded. Pre-production on Killzone 1 began before the turn of the millennium, and its World War II inspired themes and plots solidifying sometime 2000 or 2001. Killzone 2, meanwhile, began its development in a very different geopolitical world. In the intervening years between the game's releases, the Iraq War passed its second anniversary, then its third, its fourth, fifth and sixth. The conflict in Afghanistan was continuing without end in sight, the 2006 israel Hezbollah war in Lebanon, American drone strikes across Pakistan, anti-terror campaigns in Africa and the Middle East. It was bad. Culturally, there was a growing skepticism of governments in the West. The once jingoistic popular support for the Iraq invasion soured as the years went on. Questions started being asked more publicly about motives and transparency. Quagmire entered the common vocabulary with reference to these never-ending occupations with toppled strongman dictators like Saddam Hussein seeming to leave behind vacuums for further problems. I could go on, but most of you probably remember the way of the world during the years in 9-11's aftermath. Not that this was a first. There was the same type of anti-war sentiment surrounding the Vietnam War, another invasion by the world's largest, most powerful and best funded military against a distant foreign country defended by farmers as much as conventional military forces. But there's little doubt that the 2000s was the moment in which the illusion of American or Western exceptionalism, and its role as an inscrutable force for good in the world, was broken. Was the invasion of Iraq or Afghanistan justified? While Saddam was a dictator, does the damage caused by his removal, not to mention in the years since, outweigh the damage he might have caused himself? By what right does a country half a world away have to enact regime change, and when, if ever, should this right be used? Can democracy be reliably brought by force? Or does the very presence and involvement of foreign powers, with their own economic or geopolitical interests, make no mistake, ultimately cause instability which prevents the organic formation of democratic institutions? These are just some of the questions raised time and time again, and don't worry, this does come back to Killzone. The original game had already proven that it wasn't afraid to dabble in grey areas regarding its backstory, but within the content of the game itself, was ultimately still a story of ragtag heroes defending their country from space Nazis. However, no matter which way you spin Killzone 2, you cannot find yourself with that same clean, cut and dry summary. At best, it's a tragic tale of a failed and costly attempt to topple an oppressive regime which threatens interplanetary peace. While at its worst, it's a failed attempt to enact regime change by a military superpower against a hostile but nevertheless weakened and historically oppressed neighbour, resulting in the extrajudicial assassination of a head of state, the annihilation of any hope for peace, the creation of a power vacuum, and the further radicalisation of an already hostile population. Not to mention, there's another angle to this I've been ignoring entirely. Remember that line I said was one of the most important of the game? Once they exported it as power, now they hoard it for war. This planet was remarkable. The power generator for half the universe, till Vizari turned it into a war machine. We know that Helgan has always been a source of energy, but this addition, retcon really, in Killzone 2 makes it clear that Evelyn, and by extension the ISA, is well aware of Helgan's mineral wealth, enough to know the ore by name as well as its properties. How much, I wonder, was Vecta's decision to invade, even against UCN rulings, motivated by the side benefit of opening up petrosite production in the system? currently nationalised by Vizari's regime, or at least nationalised in the sense that the Vizari Corporation owns most of the refineries, the state is run by the Senate, and, well, Vizari is the Senate. Given that the UCN recommended blockade and sanctions would have effectively ended the Helgas threat to Vecta, maybe there were indeed undisclosed motivations for wanting boots on the ground. Did Vecta intelligence really drop the ball that badly when they convinced Vecta that an invasion would be quick and easy with minimal resistance? Or, at higher levels, was the cost deemed worth it for an amicable Helgan administration? War's over, Vasari. 
You lost. Really, Sergeant? And who won? The cowards who commanded you and your comrades here to die. After all, and once again, we've hit the unreliable narrator. For we're just troops on the ground. All we know is what we're told. Can't fucking believe this. Command should have sent a fucking company in here at least. Instead, it's four guys and a scientist. No wonder things came up blue. Why do we always have to pay in blood for their school ones? So, is Killzone meant to be taken as allegory for anything in particular? Is it World War II with a sudden halfway switch to the War on Terror? I'm not sure it's so simple. Allegory itself is arguably not really all that useful as a tool. It runs the risk of being backwards looking, too prone to the audience simply nodding in agreement that yes, that is like that thing what once existed. Everybody's favourite, I read books in high school, Animal Farm, perhaps the best known allegorical work, is incredibly prone to this type of oversimplified analysis. Hands up if you covered this in English class, and the extent of the discussion was Napoleon is Stalin, the horse is the proletariat, the farmers are capitalists, and since at the end they looked for man to pig and pig to man and couldn't tell the difference, don't do communism, children. Proof. Never mind the fact George Orwell was a socialist. This type of analysis lets everyone reading post-Soviet Union off the hook for any type of introspection. Since Stalin isn't a thing anymore and Russia's nice and free now, we can all just enjoy this nice book about talking animals. All while ignoring our own slide into authoritarianism. There is a pretty famous quote by Tolkien disparaging allegory, with regards to whether the Lord of the Rings was meant as one for World War II. You've likely heard it before, maybe even taken it to mean his story is just meant as that, separate from reality. But there's an optimist second part to the quote, which happens to be quite appropriate here. I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations, and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of readers. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader, and the other in the purpose domination of the author. I'll just leave that there. The Second Extrasolar War may be allegorical in some ways to specific historical moments, but to me at least, I find its applicability to human conflict as a concept, in all its varying forms, far more compelling. Where one can see 1940s Europe reflected in its story, another might see Vietnam, or Iraq, or the risks posed by a future war between the superpowers of today or tomorrow should we fail to take the steps to avoid it. Either way, by shedding the constraints of allegory, the series can do more than simply act as a sci-fi skinned reflection on events past, and the feigned history of Vecta and Helgan, and its ultimate conclusion, may now be as open-ended as our own. Hey. Uh, in case you're wondering, no, uh, I didn't buy any of this for a, for a skit or anything. I just have it all lying around, so I figured it should at least, you know, make an appearance. I mean, otherwise, I'd have at least tried to write something smart to make, you know, buying it all have a point. Anyway, I just wanted to thank you for watching to this point. This project ended up being far beyond what I expected. So much so that I decided it makes sense to split it in two, with the second half of the series, Killzone 3, Mercenary and Shadowfall, coming up in part two, which will drop a week from this one, I think. I can't see a fucking thing through these. I'd like to give a special thanks to my patrons who have been extremely patient with this thing. It has been far and away the largest single project I've done for YouTube. I can only hope it's lived up to expectations so far. But I'll see you again in part two. Part two. This is a two-parter. I swear to God, if I still get people crying that I forgot about the other games, I'm gonna... Part two!